In New York City, I'm Shauna Smith alongside Brad Smith, and this is Yahoo Finance's flagship show, The Morning Brief. That's right. Stock futures here this morning. We are off the lows of the morning after an Iranian media downplayed the impact of Israel's retaliatory strike. Initial reports of the attack spurred a rush to safe havens such as gold. Right now, you're taking a look at futures across the board, still lower, but off of some of the lows that we had seen before in the future. And the other big driver this morning of investor sentiment is earnings. We've got Netflix shares falling in early action after disappointing the street. So let's get right to it. The three things that you need to know at your roadmap for today's trading day. Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman, Ines Frey, and Alexandra Canal have more. Futures in the red after Israel carried out a retaliatory military operation against Iran overnight. Three explosions heard close to a military base in central Iran after Israel launched a number of drones. This comes after Iran launched an unprecedented air attack against Israel last week, growing tensions in the Middle East now threatening to push the region into wider conflict. And we're also watching commodities this morning. Oil prices initially trading higher with Brent crude futures topping $90 a barrel. But now prices are retreating after investors have had more time to digest Israel's retaliatory attack on Iran. Spot gold prices also surging to fresh all-time highs on ongoing Middle East tensions. And Netflix reporting first quarter earnings that beat Wall Street ex expectations. The streaming giant added more than 9 million subscribers in the first quarter, proving that its password sharing crackdown is paying off. But investors were surprised to hear that Netflix would stop reporting quarterly memberships starting next year. That, coupled with the company's disappointing second quarter and full year revenue guidance, dragging the stock more than 6% lower in pre-market trading this morning. Tensions between Israel and Iran escalating overnight. Israel retaliating, retaliating excuse me, against Iran for last weekend's attack. So let's see how markets are reacting here this morning and just shifting things over to some of the futures that we've been tracking. Yes, there we go. As we're calibrating our Wi-Fi interactive, the Dow futures, as we mentioned a moment ago, flat just barely to the downside here. And then the NASDAQ futures, NASDAQ 100 right now down by about two tenths of a percent. S&P 500 futures also still in the red. We're, we'll see if we're able to pair a little bit more of the declines, at least in the futures here, as we get closer to the start of today's trading activity as well here. Yeah, exactly. I mean, take a look at some of the other uh, reaction that we are seeing play out. Gold initially catching a bid there, now moving to the downside. Also important to point out some of the action that we're seeing play out in the crude market in oil right now, because this has been a bit surprising. When we talk about the fact and we started the trading week on Monday, following that initial attack from Iran, there was lots of thought that we would see more of a reaction play out in the energy market. And once again today, we are seeing a similar reaction here. We did see that initial spike. If you take a look, I don't know if this chart is going to actually show it. You can see initially spiking there, but we have given back some of those gains as the morning has caught on. Again, the fact that Iranian media is downplaying the real impact of these retaliatory strikes. That's why we have seen a bit of a reversal here ahead of today's trading day. So again, crude right now still trading just above 82 bucks a share, but again, moving to the downside here this morning. That's right. All right, let's get a closer look at some of these commodity moves with our very own Ines Ferre. Ines. Yeah, Shauna, and oil markets coming off that knee-jerk reaction that we saw overnight. Immediately after last night's attack, oil prices spiked up more than 3% to levels really similar to where they were last Friday leading up to Iran's strike against Israel over the weekend. So throughout this past week, we saw the unwinding of that risk premium on oil prices, on the expectation that Israel would not strike Iran's oil production. And now we're seeing price easing. In fact, uh, prices is still right now elevated, though, around the $82 a barrel level for uh, for WTI, for Brent crude. You're seeing uh, prices uh, that are elevated for this year, 2024 uh, prices. But I will tell you that Iran produces about 3 million barrels of oil a day. So this has been very important, what traders had been watching throughout the week to make sure that that oil production was not 
interrupted because if it had been interrupted, you had some analysts saying that you could see oil spike to $100, $105 a barrel when it comes to Brent. As far as gold is concerned, gold also touching fresh all-time highs overnight. Remember, now we have seen gold uh, going up for five straight weeks in a row on expectations that rates will come down uh, later this year and also as a safe haven for these uh, geopolitical risks that you're seeing. And then we are have been also watching Bitcoin, Bitcoin going below $60,000 uh, per token overnight. And now Bitcoin trading around the 64000 level, guys. All right, Ines, thanks so much for taking in a check on some of the movement that we're seeing here ahead of the open. Well, futures, they are well off the lows of the session after Iranian media really downplayed the impact of Israel's retaliatory strike here this morning. You can see ahead of the open, all three of the major averages on track to open the day to the downside, yet we are seeing trading action just below the flat line. So let's talk about the impact of what this could have to your portfolio. We want to bring in Sonu Varghis of Carson Group's a global macro strategist. Sonu, it's great to see you. So, so just walk us through, I guess, what you make of this morning's action here ahead of the open and how big of a risk this ri the rising geopolitical tensions really pose here to investors at this point. Uh, no, thank you for having me. Uh, uh, geopolitical tensions, especially in the Middle East, that's been on the cards really since last October. And then we saw oil prices spike at that time, and then it fell. And we've kind of seen something similar. Last night, uh, we were following markets, and there was a lot. There was a fog of war, right? But uh, after everything, all the reports came out, it seems like Israel's strike was smaller than expected in some ways. And Iranian officials are also downplaying it. And which is why I think uh, futures have rallied. Uh, S&P 500 futures had fallen about 1.7% last night when the initial reports broke, and uh, it's rallied to almost flat right now. And this is another reminder, like even in our portfolios, we are overweight equities. We've been overweight equities since late 2022 at uh, Carson Investment Research because we didn't expect a recession. But we still have uh, protection in the portfolio. We have some gold in the portfolios. We have some treasuries. Treasuries caught a bid last night as well. 10-year uh, treasury yields jumped from about for uh, 65 thereabouts down to 450 uh, and now it's back up again so it just goes to show that there is value in protection in all these safe havens even though you know like i said we are overweight risk assets here what type of risk assessment would you place on the ongoing tensions though as we're continuing to of course see the retaliatory strikes happen but uh, of course the state media downplaying that at this point in time and, and how the investors are going to run through that risk assessment as well for the most part what we are focused on is does this shift the macroeconomic regime that we are already in hmm. historically if you look back at events like this uh, whether it's the cuban missile crisis uh, president kennedy's assassination even more recently the uh, israel strike against the iranian general uh, a few years ago if we were in a recession if the macroeconomic backdrop was already weak these sort of geopolitical tensions add to that, it makes things even weaker. But otherwise, if the macroeconomic backdrop is strong, which is what we believe right now, uh, payrolls are strong, consumption strong, but the production side of the economy is coming back as well. So in that event, I don't think, uh, we don't think geopolitical tensions will significantly exacerbate that. So, so now we're using opportunity in the market. We have certainly seen, a, I guess you could call it a flight to safety, certainly risk off sentiment really dominate the market's narrative at least this week. Is this something that you see continuing as you look ahead or will we see a bit of a reassurance as earnings season continues to get underway? I think we see that reassurance. I mean, markets have been up a lot over the last five, six months, 12 months, really. Markets up 30% through the end of March on a one-year basis. Remember last year, this time, we were worried about regional banks failing and a larger banking crisis. We've gone, I think we've moved past that now, and I think the economy is in a better place uh, to the extent that uh, investors are expecting that too. If you look at uh, you know Fed fund futures, at the beginning of the year, markets are expecting about six to seven rate cuts. I think there was some a feeling that, okay, inflation's falling, maybe the economy is slightly weaker on as well, and maybe payroll growth will slow. We haven't seen that. Payroll growth has accelerated. Inflation has firmed. So markets are now expecting only about two rate cuts for the rest of the year. I think it's stretched a little bit. The inflation 
firming narrative has stretched a little bit too far on the other side. The pendulum has swung now. So we actually increased duration in our portfolios recently, right? As a function of that, we thought, okay, you know, duration, we were underweight duration uh, since 2021, really. And we started moving back into duration through the end of last year. And even a couple of weeks back, we increased duration because we thought that narrative of inflation firming has gone too far. Sonu, thanks so much for taking the time here this morning, really laying this out for us as we continue to track the developments. Sonu Varghese, who is the Carson Group Global Mark, er, Macro Strategist, thanks so much for taking the time. Thank you for having me. Certainly. And we're shifting gears here as well this morning. Netflix shares, we're tracking NFLX as they're under pressure in pre-market trading. This coming after the streaming giant announces some changes to how they report subscriber numbers in the future. To break down what we learned from the report, Yahoo Finance reporter Alexandra Canal here with us in studio. Hey, Ali. Hey, Brad. Well, let's start with you just what you just laid out. The fact that they are no longer going to be reporting subscriber figures. This is a significant announcement for the streaming industry at large because this has been the metric that a lot of investors really base their decisions on. The stock often falls or rises depending on those subscriber gains or losses. So the fact that we're no longer going to be seeing that is pretty disappointing. And that's part of the reason why we're seeing shares dip lower in pre-market trading. Another reason is the fact that we saw uh, revenue guidance for the second quarter along with full year 2024 come in below expectations. Coming into this print, it was really expected that Netflix would potentially beat and raise. And because that didn't happen, we saw shares react the way that they did. So something to, to keep in mind moving forward. But that is one thing that uh, definitely is going to stick with investors. Netflix said it wants to be deliberate in how they roll this out. That's why it's not happening until 2025. And along with no longer revealing subscriber figures, they're also no longer going to be revealing ARM or average revenue per member. That is something that is, uh, you know, tells us monetization strategies for the company. So that's significant as well. You're seeing on your screen there another thing that we saw is that the password sharing crackdown is paying off. Netflix is not the only company that has committed to password sharing crackdowns. It certainly was the first. And that's why you're seeing companies like Disney and Warner Brothers Discovery start to roll out their own initiatives because it is working for Netflix. The streaming giant added more than 9 million subscribers in the quarter. This comes after they added 13 million in the fourth quarter. So they're continuing to add subs. And that's another reason why they don't think they need to have their subscriber numbers disclosed because all of these subs are different. And that brings me to my third point, the advertising tier. That is continuing to do well. And it's contributing to that top line revenue number, the free cash flow. Analysts on the street have said by 2025, that's really where we're going to realize the full effects of the advertising tier. They they said they continue to see improvements there. And as more people mm -hmm. sign up for the service, they are opting for that ad tier because it's a cheaper plan. And we know that subscriptions overall are very expensive. So Wall Street pretty bullish on this report, despite the fact that we're seeing shares move lower in pre-market trading. I mean, Pivotal Research has a street high of 800 bucks per share on this stock. So it's one name that we're going to continue to track. But Netflix has really been the king of streaming and the king of media. And I think these results really prove that. All right. The stock, though, is still down just about 7%. We're going to talk a little bit more about why exactly what you were just saying there, Ali. Thanks so much for breaking that down. So let's take a look again at shares of Netflix. They're off just about 7%, despite, like Ali was just saying, beating on earnings and subscriber growth. Now, this coming after the streaming giant announced that it's no longer going to report quarterly subscriber numbers starting next year. Here's what co-CEO Greg Peters had to say about the decision on the company's earnings call. So this change is really motivated by wanting to focus on what we see are the key metrics that we think matter most to the business. So we're going to report and guide on revenue, on OI, OI margin, uh, net income, EPS, free cash flow. We'll add a new annual guidance on a revenue range to give you a little bit more of a long term view. Um, we'll also, you know, we're not going to be silent on members as well. We'll periodically update uh, when we grow and we hit certain major milestones. We'll announce those. It's just not going to be part of our regular reporting. All right. Well, investors clearly spooked by this change. Let's get analyst reaction for that. We want to bring in Jason Bazinet, a city's managing director. Jason, it's great to see you. So clearly by the stock reaction, we're looking at shares off just about 7%. The fact, though, that Netflix is no longer going to be reporting these subscriber growth numbers. What does that tell you? What is this signal? 
Well, it may signal nothing, but I'll tell you what the street fears. Um, the stock really worked because the company has been beating net ads and the street knows it's on password sharing. And what they want to see is when we begin to lap some of these password sharing benefits, um, what's going to carry the water? How are they going to get these net ads? So right about the time that the benefit of password sharing fades, people want to see the sub number to see how well the ad tier is doing. And now Netflix isn't going to give the sub number. So that's why there's so much anxiety. It, it implies to someone that there isn't really a natural transition to continue sub growth. And so with that in mind, there's also going to be a thought for a lot of investors about the pricing power, because this is a company that's over years exhibited some of that pricing power, whether regionally, that then gets pushed more internationally. Do you think that they still have a, a firm pricing power that they're able to insert into the market and then ultimately get more margin out of? Yeah, they probably do. They do have pricing power, but I think what the market wants to see, at least what they were most animated about, is the potential aggregate revenue that they would report with the ad tier, mm. right? Because the ad tier was supposed to, while the consumer paid less, the aggregate revenue the company would generate with ads was more. And so if we're not going to be getting subs and therefore not ARPU, it, it brings into question, well, maybe the monetization on the advertising side of those ad tier subs isn't going to be as healthy. Jason, where do you think things stand? Is this specifically about questions in particular to Netflix's business, or does this also point to maybe some concerns more broadly speaking within the streaming industry? Well, no, I don't think that there's big issues in the streaming industry. I, I mean, I, I would say that, you know, everyone else on the traditional media side is facing a very different situation. They're just trying to get losses down to zero mm -hmm. to demonstrate they can break even. What Netflix is really doing is trying to widen the distance between itself and rivals. And I, I would say one other thing that, that happened on the call that was important qualitatively is a lot of bulls on the street were expecting content spending to be flat going forward at 17 and a half billion. The company said, no, we're gonna continue to increase content spending a little bit less than revenue grows, but it will go up. And when you saw the stock up at 620 a share, the buy side began to poke on levers in their model that could get them more upside. And that was one of the main things. What if content spending's flat? We get more free cash flow, stock goes higher, and they just poured cold water on that. What, what type of content spending would you like to see them do? Is it, is it international content? Is it sports content where there's a highly competitive market for some of those rights coming up too? So I get some pushback on this thesis, but my because I've covered traditional media for so long, I know that a global piece of content is very hard to find. If you really want to deepen penetration, deepen engagement, you know, in Germany and Italy and South Korea and Brazil, it has to be local. And so a lot of what I think the company is grappling with, whether it's their video game push or maybe sports push, is trying to find some piece of content that scales globally. And when, when you get that, you're starting to move away from scripted content towards alternatives like video games and sports. And that seems to be where the company is opening the door to doing something along those two new vectors. Does that, does that mean more unscripted content, more, more love is blind? <laughs> it just means something different than, than, than scripted content or unscripted content. That's what scales best globally. All right, Jason, let's talk about another big uh, story that we're following here today, another stock that you cover, and that is Paramount. When you take a look at share reaction here this morning, we've got the stock up just about 10% here in early trading, and it is on reports that Sony is in talks here to join a potential bid by Apollo for interest in or potentially taking over Paramount. Your reaction to this, what this signals, and 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 then more broad, actually first into that, and then, and then I want to follow up with something real quick. Go ahead. Well, let me just start. The most important thing about Paramount is there's a, an entity that sits above it called National Amusements, and the Redstone family controls about 10% of the economics and only almost 80% of the vote. And so a lot of the deals that have been talked about in the press with Skydance were really about Skydance buying NAI's shares and essentially getting control of Paramount without paying a premium to the public shareholders. So that, that when the stock gets to 11, that's what the buy side thinks is most likely. If you end up having an alternative bidder, someone that presumably would pay all shareholders a premium, then you see the stock rally, and that's when you get closer to $14 or $15 a share. Jason, is this necessarily, though, good news here for Paramount for shareholders? Because when you take a look at some of the consolidation that has happened, mergers that have happened in the past, most recently within the media space, when you take a look at Warner Media and what has played out with Discovery, it hasn't exactly been easy. So, so does this necessarily change, I guess, the view or the uphill challenge that is still present here for a name like Paramount? 
Well, it's still a challenge. I would say what you've captured is the consensus right now on the buy side, which is media consolidation does not work, has not allowed them to compete effectively with Netflix. It's it's absolutely the wrong conclusion to draw. It's a, it's a fair observation. It's been more difficult, but consolidation is is absolutely critical for these companies to compete. Why? Because consolidation means fewer apps. It means you can put more content on those apps without spending more money. That ultimately is going to reduce churn, reduce marketing spend. So it's absolutely critical. So the main thing that the street wants to see if there is consolidation is leverage has to go down day one. That's the most important thing. What's the most identifiable difference that customers could or should expect if Paramount does get acquired? Well, I think you'll see fewer apps. <laughs> That's what I would say. I mean, I, you know, presumably what what uh, if this bid between Apollo and, and Sony is right, Sony's really sort of an arms dealer, right? So they're going to presumably take the studio and just feed everybody's app. And then I would think that someone on the private equity side would sort of not want to absorb the losses from a streaming app like Paramount Plus and would just focus on the cash generative assets and pay down debt to create equity value. Jason Bazinet, who is the City Managing Director. Thanks so much for taking the time this morning, Jason. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks. Coming up, everyone, the problems keep on piling up for Tesla. We'll break down why shares are falling yet again. Let's take a look at some trending tickers. American Express posting a beat in the first quarter. Revenue jumping 11% from a year ago. Yahoo Finance's executive editor, Brian Sazi, had a chance to speak with the CEO of American Express, Stephen Squarey, on the back of these results. Brian, good to see you. What were the takeaways? Yeah, just uh, two influential guys on the phone call right after earnings. But look, good quarter by Amex. Uh, overall card member spending up 7%. Year over year, excluding the impact of currency. Good there. International card services segment sales up 13% year over year. Uh, another good quarter for Amex on getting more millennial card members onto that platform and spending pretty aggressively. Brad, you could appreciate this one, uh, having covered Delta very closely. Another good, strong quarter with the folks over at Delta. Thinking about, Stephen's thinking about now what else they could be doing with Delta uh, in the months and years ahead. Nonetheless, this is what Stephen told me. I asked him because we have been seeing uh, some pressure on, on consumer spending. We saw it within a lot of the results by the big banks. Uh, J.P. Morgan, to a lesser extent, Bank of America, nonetheless, because of inflation. Steven said, look, uh, our customers are, are a little wealthier. Uh, they're feeling pretty good. We have a premium customer base. They have more money. Uh, and they're out there spending. They're traveling. They're going to restaurants. Uh, you name it. Uh, so that higher-end consumer continues to benefit uh, all things Amex and why you're seeing, I think, just better results from this company 
uh, in their cards business compared to some of the big banks uh, that we heard this week. And Brian, also just a willingness here to pay for fees. So much, I think in the past, consumers were a bit hesitant to pay for some of these fees when it comes to uh, the credit cards. But when you take a look at these numbers here, at least for Amex, well, the cards of, like, the, the, the cards that come with a fee accounted for 70% mm -hmm. of their new account acquisitions. Really so showing, speaking to your point there, the strength of the consumers, particularly their consumer right now, and the willingness to pay up for that because um, of the reward. My friends at Visa MasterCard are going to squash me on this. But look, the Amex card is just, it's just cool. I mean, you get a lot of stuff. I mean, you pay, what, six ninety five a year for, for the card? You got a lot of perks. You pay even more than that, you can get even more perks at a Delta and hang out in the Sky Lounge. I mean, it all just works. The ecosystem this company has created, uh, of course, this is a key Warren Buffett holding, but the ecosystem they have created, and partly why Buffett owns the stock, is because they have that ecosystem, and they do have wealthier consumers, and they have strong relationships. Nonetheless, uh, a couple takeaways uh, for investors here, if you want to boil down this quarter. Ed, 3.4 million card members in the quarter equals impressive. It really, that's a really big number. High-income consumer is doing just fine, as I mentioned. But do keep an eye on the health of small businesses. Uh, this was the first time, we talked to Steve every quarter, uh, first time I heard him call out some weakness in small business spending. Mm -hmm. So something to watch, is that a sign or of things maybe slowing down the economy towards the back half of the year? Unclear to me, but something to keep an eye on. It could be potentially worrisome here for the broader economy. All right, Brian, thanks so much. Yep. Let's take a look at another trending stock here on Yahoo Finance this morning, and that is Tesla. Look at that shares off just about 1%, so pairing some of the earlier selling that we did see this morning. Now, more bad news here for the EV maker, recalling nearly 4,000 of its cyber trucks over faulty accelerated pedal. Accelerated pedal, that can potentially stick here, so that's having a real impact on the stock this morning. So far, they've received notice from two customer claims related to this issue. But the takeaway here is a couple of things. One, this is actually also by giving us a glimpse into how many cyber trucks potentially right. have been sold <laughs> up until this point. So kind of buried beneath the headline, the fact that there has been almost 4,000 uh, cyber trucks now on the road. That is a number that hasn't necessarily been disclosed in terms of their deliveries so far, production and delivery numbers. But then also just points of more trouble here for a stock. We've been talking about it now time and time again that has a run into trouble. Shares are down about 40% since the start of the year. And Elon Musk and his team are struggling a little bit to turn things around, turn the narrative around on the street. Yeah, and you think about ultimately the fact that they just started delivering this vehicle in Q4 of last year. And so the fact that, yeah, 4,000, as you mentioned, we know that there are that many that actually need to be recalled or out there on the road. That's a significant, well, at least move forward in the delivery compared to the overall figure that they've been talking about in recent earnings call. What, a million mm -hmm. reservations for the Cybertruck to this point, or at least to the point of the last earnings call. So that particularly shows you, number one, I think in the recall, it's it's going to have a broader sentiment impact as well. You've already heard some of the issues, even from reviewers who had gotten a car to be able to test and saying, all right, this doesn't make the mark on multiple things that Tesla had said it would. And so now it's a larger question of, okay, will this have uh, some type of dent on the sentiment for potential buyers and prospective buyers out there as well? We're also tracking shares of Trump Media this morning, jumping in pre-market trading on news that a CEO, Devin Nunez, sent a letter to NASDAQ warning of potential market manipulation from short sellers. The company also sent shareholders detailed instructions on how to avoid loaning out their DJT shares to short sellers. Well, the company's shares right now, they're up by about 12%. Uh, and there were some insider trading allegations that came forward and I think were ultimately uh, proceeded with. So uh, short sellers, one thing, insider trading, another thing. There's been a lot swirling around this company that still is so detached from fundamentals at this point. Yeah, time. and the letter here being sent uh, to NASDAQ CEO Dina Friedman just asking for help to prevent some of this illegal naked short selling, at, at least from their perspective, that's happening right now, trying to make sure that there is a disclosure there on these short positions. You're seeing the reaction play out in this stock once again today. Now to the upside, adding even more volatility to a name that has really traded all over the place since this since this merger uh, was done here. I mean, it has garnered much uh, retail investor interest here over the last couple of weeks. We've seen the wild swings in the stock well off the highs that you can see right there on your screen uh, just after that merger had been completed at the end of March here. Now here we are trading just above 33 bucks a share. Yeah, help. People don't like us. They're trying to crash our stock. We need help. 
All right, welcome to the public markets mm -hmm. out here, ultimately. That's the, uh, we're counting down to the opening, but we've got just about 40 seconds left. It's been a wild week, to say the least, here. You've got geopolitical conflict. You've got, of course, even more of the Fed speak that's taking place. I mean, who didn't speak this week is the question. Uh, and so with all of the different proliferations of where the rate policy could move and some of the headlines that have been garnered, some of those saying, what is there to, to need to cut right now. Um, and that's something that has prevailed over the course of this week as well, too. And that also coupled with earnings, too. Yeah. Earnings season getting underway. We're really seeing the strength of corporate America right now and also seeing just the fact that so many of these results here are priced to perfection at this point. When you take a look at the reaction in Netflix's share price today, the fact that the stock is getting hit so hard after actually beating on earnings and subscribers, that's really as of note here and could potentially uh, tell us about some of the future reaction that we could see to these earnings results this earnings season. Whoa, they're throwing hats at the New York Stock Exchange. You folks see that at home? All right, tossing hats. Who's up there on the podium? That's Abbott, ticker symbol ABT. I can't uh, get a clear line of sight on uh, who their special guests might be, but you've also We've got GMG at the NASDAQ ringing the open bell. They had some fun Fetty. Looks like they've got some of their team members there on that virtual wall. Good stuff. All right, let's take a look at where we are opening the day, at least taking a look at the big word here for the Dow, because this is really to note. We had been off over 300, I think, in futures action here earlier this morning. Now we're actually opening to the positive side, to the upside here, up just about a tenth of a percent. Taking a look at the S&P 500, that's still under a bit of a pressure, just trading just below the flat line, the NASDAQ opening right now as well. But taking a look, Brett, going back to your point here just a few minutes ago, on what a wild week it has been, or a tough week it has been, here for the markets. You're looking at a five-day decline for the S&P, off nearly 2.5%. When you flip it back over to the Dow and some of that selling action that we have seen in the Dow as well, that's off just about a half of a percent over the last five trading days. Yeah, that's your classic uh, shrugging uh technical chart pattern right there that you're seeing. So uh, we'll see if we can find some direction here during today's trading session to wrap up this week. We were also taking a look at some of the sectors. There you go. Also reading my mind here. <laughs> Take a look at XLV out of the gate this morning. That's leading the pack. That's up by about half a percent. So healthcare leading the pack. But technology, technology yesterday as well to begin the session. That was the biggest laggard that we had seen. Right now it's just jousting with communication services and consumer discretionary, it looks like, for that lagging position. All right, we'll keep it right here on Yahoo Finance. On the other side of the break, we are going to get a closer look at commodities with oil and gold, both retreating from earlier highs this morning. We've got much more on the morning brief. Stay tuned.
We're monitoring oil prices this morning after Iran downplayed Israel's attack on the country. To break down the moves that we've seen in commodities, we've got Scott Bauer, Prosper Trading Academy CEO, here with us. Scott, great to see you. Just want to get Good your morning. reaction to, to what we're hearing out of the region and the impact that you're seeing on oil prices. Sure. Obviously, with what happened last night, really emphasizes how much geopolitical risk is priced in to the price of crude right now, whether it's you know $5 a barrel, whether it's $10 a barrel, you can see how volatile that is. And you know when, when you break that down, you know if we were lived in a perfect world and there was none of this risk, where would oil be, be trading right now? Um, I, I don't know that exact number, but what I do know is that globally, economic numbers are, are really not so bad. So, you know, where, where we haven't had a supply issue at all, you know, really for the last, you know, months or so, the demand side of things is picking up. That to me is really what is, you know, keeping uh, the pedal down on the price of, of gas and the price of, of a barrel of oil. Yes, the geopolitical risk is there, but uh, I, I don't see a big pullback anytime soon here unless we really start to see a deterioration globally, you know, economically. And, and we're certainly not seeing it here in the U.S. So, Scott, if we do see any sort of escalation uh, from what is happening right now, what has played out right now, if, we, is, if there is any sort of retaliation here from Iran, it doesn't appear that, that that is likely. But if that is a scenario, what could that potentially then do to the price of crude? Is that is that what it ultimately is going to take to trigger a bigger move to the upside? So a couple things. First, the, re the real risk of this is that the Strait of Hormuz closes down mm -hmm. or, or consolidates to the point where we can't get, you know, crude through there because 20 percent of the world's supply passes through there. So that is the big risk. It's not a risk of, you know, that Iran is not going to supply anything or, or you know, oil is not going to still be pumped. It's the delivery. So that's that's number one. Number two, where do we go from here? I know people are pegging $100. I think that's just an easy number because it's a psychological number. And what we have to keep in mind is when the, the start of the conflict between Russia and Ukraine began, we saw oil prices spike all the way to 125. I don't see that happening, but, but the upside concern here, you know, the, the potential, maybe as, as small of a, a percentage as it might be, the potential for this to escalate into something globally, that, is, you know, that can't be taken out of the equation. Scott, it's interesting. And, you know, I've, I've been tracking your your Twitter or X posts uh, for, for some time now. And, you know, we were talking about how wild of a week it's been. You put some numbers on this with the VIX hitting 19.56, highest intraday level since October 31st of last year. When, when you think about what's going into that volatility right now, that fear gauge index, is this the market looking at the international conflict and saying we can't take off the table that this isn't contained, or is it more of the thought process around the Fed speak that we've heard over the course of this week as well, and even kicking the can on any type of rate cut? Yeah, I think it is more eco data and the Fed as opposed to the geopolitical risk, why we're seeing you know elevated VIX. But you know we have to remember with everything that the, it has been thrown at the market over the last few months or so, Fed, strong economic data and the geopolitical risk, we're still sitting, what, only 4% or so off of the highs. To me, that's a win for the market, but that doesn't mean that we can't go lower. I'm not suggesting that's going to happen, but there are still so many headwinds out there, any of which you know, individually could really put a damper on this market. And I think in the upcoming weeks when we get reports out of Microsoft and Apple and Alphabet and, and the rest of the big guys, and we obviously saw Netflix last night, that is going to have a big effect on psychology. And if the market can remain at these levels while we're seeing the 10-year at 450 plus and approaching 5%, while the Fed has changed course and gone from you know, three rate cuts to maybe no rate cuts and potentially even a rate hike this year. Scott, real quick, let's take a look at the price of gold, because I also think that's worth pointing out here when we're talking about this flight to safety. It might be a bit surprising out there to investors to see gold actually under pressure here today. What does that tell you? Yeah. Are we seeing some maybe short term exhaustion within the gold market? 
I, I don't know. I still think there's a lot of tailwinds to the gold market. We did see the initial reaction of that you know, classic flight to safety happened last night. Gold rallied over 1%. We saw the dollar rally. We even saw the yen rally. So all those classic flight to safety, you know, areas, those did get impacted last night. And, you know, then as soon as we, we got news or, you know, the, the market is is saying, okay, this isn't as bad as what we had initially thought, we are seeing a little bit of a pullback here. But I certainly think that, you know, the trend and and the the upside to gold is still there, especially while there's everything going on in the Middle East and the potential for this to, to unfortunately, you know, rise in a little bit, you know, whether it's this week, next week, in a month from now, that risk is still there. All right, Scott, always great to get your insight. Thanks so much for hopping on with us this morning. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. We're going to turn to some trending tickers here at Yahoo Finance. Alexandra Canal standing by in the newsroom at the big board with a closer look at some of those movers. Allie. Hey guys, yes, kicking things off with our number one trending ticker, Netflix. Shares are down this morning despite the company beating earnings across the board on Thursday. The stock drop comes as Netflix said it will stop reporting quarterly membership numbers starting next year, along with average revenue per member or arm, which is an important profitability metric for many of these media companies. Netflix also posted disappointing second quarter and full year revenue guidance, which did not please investors since expectations were so high heading into this print, not to mention the fact that val the valuation on shares were also high. Despite it all, though, Wall Street remains very bullish on this stock. We had Pivotal Research out with a new note this morning, raising its price target on shares to 800 bucks. That's the highest on the street. Now we're going to move on to another media name in focus this morning, and that is Paramount. Reuters reporting that private equity firm Apollo Global is discussing a joint buyout bid with some Sony. Now, this is the latest in a string of potential bids that have circled the media giant over the past several months. Paramount is currently in the midst of an exclusive negotiation window with production company Skydance Media until early May. But some investors have expressed concerns over that deal and have been encouraging the company to explore other options. Apollo previously made a $26 billion bid for the company and a separate $11 billion offer for Paramount's film studio. Reuters said the Sony deal would offer cash for all outstanding shares and take the company private. But as you can see, shares are up nearly 10%. And then finally, I want to round things out with Tesla. The stock is off slightly this morning after the company recalled certain Cybertruck vehicles over concerns that an accelerator could become stuck. Now, this comes after Deutsche Bank downgraded shares on Thursday, citing Tesla shift away from its $25,000 Model 2 vehicle in order to prioritize its robo -tech taxi program. Tesla, it's just been one of those names that's seen its stock drop significantly over the past several months, with shares down about 40 percent since the start of the year. Shauna. All right, Ali, thanks so much. Number of movers here this morning. Yeah, indeed. Busy uh, Friday. Hello, movers. All right, guys, coming up, a deeper dive into the ongoing tensions in the Middle East. We'll break down what fallout we can expect from Israel's retaliatory attack against Iran. Stay with us.
Well, tensions rising in the Middle East after Israel's retaliatory military strike on Iran. Iranian media is now downplaying the severity of this incident. Al Jazeera reporting that an Iranian parliament member is calling the attack a desperate attempt. Joining us now is Yahoo Finance a senior columnist Rick Newman. Rick, it's good to see you. So obviously, on the heels of this, there's a little bit cons of concern about escalation fears and exactly what that could potentially look like. So, so just give us, I guess, a lay of the land of where things stand today and how likely it is that we will see any sort of escalation. I, I think we could interpret this almost uh, the opposite direction, Shauna. I think markets had priced in more escalation than we actually got here. And I'll just give you, I'll, I'll just read quickly from one note I'm looking at. This is from Moody's Analytics. A soft, uh, a soft Israeli military response to Iran's weakened attack will arrest the upward momentum in oil prices. And I, I, the way that analysts interpret what happens is almost as, as important as what actually happens. And I think we're seeing that in the price of oil today. Um, it is not going up. I mean, it's actually drifting down maybe just a little bit as if this attack will have no effect. So what's if you read between the lines here, both sides, Israel and Iran, seem to be indicating that they want to be finished with this overt um, shooting phase and return to the, uh, you know, to the shadow war that we've had for, uh, I don't know, 45 years or however long it's been. Um, so I think there's a reasonably good chance that we're not going to see any more missiles and drones uh, flying between these two countries in the, in the foreseeable future. This does not mean the war is over. I mean, Israel is still uh, conducting its operation in Gaza against Hamas. That could go on for some time, and this will remain unpredictable. But it feels like we dodged a bullet here. And to what extent, Rick, are we seeing the White House and, and the U.S. response also impact markets? Nobody is saying very much about this, and, and I think that's, that's good news. Um, Israel is not saying very much about it. Iran is kind of acting like they handled this. They, they shot, they're saying they shot down a couple of drones with no damage. And that's really important because uh, part of the dynamic here is when these nations and these leaders in the Middle East uh, posture. I mean, a lot of this is about posturing, and it's the manhood contest to prove no one's going to push us around. Israel's not going to push us around. Iran is not going to push us around. Uh, and what you hear the leaders in the country saying often tells you what they're going to do next. And uh, neither side here is saying um, that we have to keep going. No, no one is saying, um, oh, now we have to retaliate further. Let, let's hope that is the case, um, because virtually everybody involved here would benefit if this just settles down. All right, Rick, thanks so much for continuing to track all the movements here, both in tensions as well as in the markets here and pairing that. Appreciate it. Bye, guys. All your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Time now to take a look at the Russell 2000. So far, down 4% this year, and more importantly, underperforming the S&P 500's percent, well, the percentage gain that we've seen in the S&P 500. A year to date, uh, as of right now, you're seeing it up just shy of 5%. Many stock experts had hoped for a rebound in small cap performance, but with rate cuts remaining very uncertain, the Russell 2000, popular early year trade has disappointed. So let's bring in Josh Schaefer for more on this. Why? Yeah, Brad. So most of the strategists we were talking to back in January and December, right, a lot of people that came on this show, a very popular call was small caps are going to rally this year. It was largely based on sort of valuations, the valuation for the Russell 2000 significantly lower on a historical basis to the S&P 500. It still is based on the performance you just showed of how the stocks have performed. But a large part of this call really had to do with the Fed cutting rates. And I spoke with Jill Carey Hall over at Bank of America. She is the head of U.S. small mid-cap strategy over there. And they had this chart, which I think is pretty illuminating for why people are sort of backing out of the small cap trade. What you're looking at is the small cap's debt, small cap's debt exposure. You can see only 54% of small cap's debt is long-term fixed. This would mean that that debt would not be exposed to higher rates, right? We've been talking a lot about the Fed being higher for longer. Well, the left side of that pie chart, at some point, if we stay higher for longer, companies are going to come back and have to borrow at these higher overnight rates. That's going to really hurt largely probably their margins. It's going to just simply cost more for them to operate. On the flip side, when you look at the S&P 500, it's a much different story. About 80% of the S&P 500's long-term debt is 80, or sorry, is long-term fixed. You can see that on this chart here. So the S&P 500 is largely less exposed to these higher for longer rates. It sort of explains to us why we've been talking a lot about how, I guess really up until this week, Stocks had sort of held up even amid the higher for longer conversation, mm -hmm. but the Russell 2000 has not. And so it seems like still for the Russell, for small caps, for us to get really a massive broadening rally where everything kind of works, you're going to need Fed rate cuts, and they might not come this year, or they might not come till later. But Josh, but, but the fact that the economy, though, is holding up, right, mm -hmm. doing better than expected, really pointing to the fact that's part of that bull case here. So even though maybe it's taking longer potentially for this call to play out. Is there still, from the conversations that you've been having, reason from strategists to be bullish here on this group, but maybe the timeline is now extended just a bit? Yeah, so if we wanted to break down the small caps call into sort of maybe three things, right, that help small caps, you just highlighted one, Sean, that is definitely still there. It would be the economy, right? Mm -hmm. The economy doing well is normally good for small cap companies. A lot of people also think their earnings are going to pick up toward the end of the year. Now, again, if earnings are picking up toward the end of the year, it's a little bit of a wait and see because earnings for this sector have not been great. Mm -hmm. So you sort of need to get to that part of the year, I think, to get some reassurances. And then the pitch would be, well, at that point, if we're talking about the fourth quarter when maybe earnings are picking up, maybe the economy is still growing well, mm -hmm. maybe you get your first Fed rate cut, mm -hmm. and then maybe that's where you start to see lift off for this index. At this point, Given the fact that we started this year with everyone talking about it, I would definitely say wait and see and caution is what a lot of strategists are saying on this index now in this area of the market, essentially saying most people are saying stay up in cap size, right? Yeah. We're talking about large caps. And mm -hmm. I think you see that a lot of days in the market action when you see the stock market get a little bit resilient, come off lows, it's large caps that are, getting pe that are sort of getting the bid. You're not seeing a lot of days recently with the Russell outperforming the S&P 500. Mm -hmm. All right, Josh Schaefer, thanks so much for bringing that down for us. We'll keep right here on Yahoo Finance. we got much more ahead. Coming up next hour, we have more on the possible fallout over Israel's latest strike on Iran. Stay tuned.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance. I'm Shauna Smith alongside of Brad Smith. We're 30 minutes into the trading day. So here are three big stories that we're following this morning. Starting with the stock action, we are looking at a mixed picture right now. You've got the Dow actually trading to the upside up just about 160. The S&P and the Nasdaq, though, still under pressure. Now markets initially falling in the pre-market action on increased tensions in the Middle East. We've seen a bit of a bounce back since the lows of the morning after Israel retaliated against Iran overnight. Now, those fears in the market have since settled as Iran has downplayed the severity of that incident and Israel has given no response. We're also watching commodities this morning. Oil and gold seesawing today, both initially spiking on news of Israel's strike against Iran. Now all three are lower. And Netflix shares are falling today. The streaming giant's second quarter guidance are falling short of the street's expectations. Now, the company also announcing that it's going to stop reporting subscriber numbers starting next year. That's really spooking the stock just a bit with shares off about 6%. Well, investors are pushing back rate cut expectations as more Fed officials say that they don't see any urgency to cut rates anytime soon. While traders are expecting that first reduction in September, our next guest believes the Fed will cut rates in November. Let's bring him in. Stephen Stanley, Santander, chief U.S. economist. Great to have you here with us this morning. Okay, so you're looking out even past September at this juncture. Why is that? Yeah, I, I think the inflation data have, you know, obviously they've proven to be much more stubborn than than I think the Fed had hoped uh, before. And I think that's going to continue to be the case for a while. So I, I think it's going to be most of the year before the Fed reaches that threshold of greater confidence that Chairman Powell's established for uh, for the Fed being able to start rate cutting. So then what does that mean for equities, Stephen? Well, I, I think, you know, we've seen a huge adjustment um, in the markets in, in terms of the timing and the magnitude of Fed rate cuts for the year. I mean, uh, it wasn't so long ago that the markets had over 150 basis points of cuts priced in for the year, and, and that now is is sitting at only 40 basis points. So I think the bulk of the adjustment in terms of the, the markets, um, you know, uh, 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 incorporating the idea of the Fed being a little later and less aggressive on rate cuts, hopefully is, is behind us at this point. Um, the good news is that part of the reason why the Fed is, is able to be so patient is that the economy has held up well, and and we've certainly seen that uh, reflected in uh, corporate earnings quarter after quarter over the last few years. You know, every quarter it feels like uh, people are braced for a for a bad set of uh, of profit numbers, and and things just seem to always uh, come in better than expected. So, I mean, the the bad news is the Fed isn't going to be cutting rates, but the good news is part of the reason why is because the economy is is outperforming expectations. What what type of additional deterioration do you think the Fed would also need to see in the employment situation in order for the thought process of cutting to really emerge and resound among some of the committee members? Right. Well, certainly if the economy really um, starts to, to head into a, a period of weakness, maybe even a recession, then, then all bets are off. Things change at that point. But hmm. assuming that the economy continues to perform okay, um, it, that's a really interesting question because the Fed seems to have shifted tack on that. I mean, for probably about 18 months, uh, Chairman Powell was consistently saying that the economy was going to need to see a period of subpar growth. We were going to have to have loosening in the labor markets if the Fed was ever going to get inflation to 2% on a sustainable basis. Uh, and then around the turn of the year, he shifted and said, well, maybe we can have our cake and eat it too. Maybe hmm. uh, inflation will come down without any sort of economic weakening. And that certainly is what the uh, the latest round of FOMC economic projections suggests. So uh, now it doesn't feel like uh, the, the, that rosy scenario is, is likely to transpire, at least in the short run. So, um, you know, I still believe that to get to that uh, preferred level on inflation, the Fed is probably going to need to see uh, the labor market weaken a bit. So, um, you know, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see how all that plays out. But um, I, I, you know, I think that the Fed has been a little bit too optimistic on that count. Yeah, Stephen, I mean, the thread really threading a needle here at, at this juncture and, and attempting to do so. And after a period where they were accused of staying transitory and staying in the transitory camp and communication stance for too long, how do they avoid that on the other side where they're looked at as staying in the higher for longer camp for too long? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, the, the central bank is always uh, very popular when it's cutting rates and and uh, not so much when it's raising rates. So there's always a you know kind of a, a chorus of of folks who are always calling for a cut. 
Um, and I think in this case, um, Chairman Powell and others have made clear that from a broader perspective, the Fed's job one here is to make sure that inflation, that they get inflation back under control. I mean, you don't, if you're Chairman Powell, you don't want to be known as the, uh, uh, the guy at the helm who allowed inflation to get out of control and end up in a repeat of the 1970s. So I, I do think the Fed is going to err on the side uh, of maybe staying high for a little bit longer, knowing that if, in fact, they do get inflation under control eventually, they'd be able to cut rates you know, reasonably quickly uh, on the other side. Stephen, what does that tell us then about the odds of a soft landing? Is that still the most likely scenario in your view? I think so. Um, I, I mean, it's funny the you know the the consensus view for so long was that the the economy was imminently headed into recession, and of course that call has been abandoned at this point. And now you hear people talking about the possibility of a no landing scenario where the economy just continues to plug along. Um, but I think you know again, in my view, to get to where we want to be on inflation, the Fed is going to need to see some slowing. And so the question is, uh, it really, is the current policy stance? Uh, sufficient to, to bring about that result. And I, I think it is, um, you know, the Fed certainly thinks it is. They've talked about how they believe the policy rate is restrictive, um, but there are also other tailwinds that have helped to propel the economy along. And so uh, I just think the Fed is gonna have to keep policy tight for longer to get the job done. All right, Stephen Stanley, we really appreciate you taking the time and uh, sharing your insight here with us this morning on Yahoo Finance. Thanks so much. My pleasure. Another big story that we're watching today is, of course, Netflix, a stock lower after announcing it will stop reporting subscriber numbers starting its first quarter of 2025. We've seen some interesting analyst reaction to this news. We spoke to City Managing Director Jason Bazinet, and here's what he had to say about the decision. Spoke to him earlier this morning. Here's what he said. People want to see the sub number to see how well the ad tier is doing. And now Netflix isn't going to give the sub number. So that's why there's so much anxiety. It, it implies to someone that there isn't really a natural transition to continue sub growth. Jason maintains a neutral rating on Netflix. Not impressed by this decision here from Netflix. But we actually saw Needham analyst Laura Martin upgrade the stock to buy from hold. Now, she's a bit more optimistic. She sees a lot of upside in revenue growth, the possible benefits from Gen AI, one of the... Uh, one of the buzzwords, once again, here, <laughs> earnings season, we talk about AI, any sort of AI connection, exactly what that could do here to boost the business, obviously giving analysts a bit more confidence in those names. So Laura Martin making the argument here that Netflix is one of those companies standing to benefit from the adoption here of Gen AI. But really, when you take a look at the streets reaction, when you take a look at analyst reaction here, it's important to put this in perspective. And I think Jason did just that, right? Because you're seeing a lot of nerves on the street when you take a look at shares of just about 6.5% a lot of that being attributed to the guidance and the fact that they're not necessarily going to report subscriber numbers going forward. But when you look under the hood here, the quarter was actually very strong here for Netflix. It yeah. shows how dominant of a player they are within the space, how they are by far the leader within the streaming industry and looking to capitalize on that momentum, like you said, and gain even a further lead ahead by making some of these adjustments and some of these investments here for the future. Yeah, a lot of hang up on the subscribers and whether or not that that's going to really change the granularity of the data and how investors can really assess the health of the company. I think there's plenty of other metrics that investors can still look to. It just shows that Netflix is not going to be giving us that same growth metric to look at quarter over quarter that we had become accustomed to getting at this point in time. So where does the attention shift? The attention should shift if you're asking Greg Peters, who's the co-CEO of Netflix, he's going to be shifting more of that annual guidance to a revenue range, give more of a long-term view there. Um, they're not going to be silent on members. They mentioned they're going to periodically update on when they grow and hit certain major milestones. They're also still going to announce those. But there's one other key figure here that I think investors should be zeroing in on, especially if you were listening in to this call last night, or even if you're just hot king or um, command effing or control effing the earnings release this this morning and it's spending the content spending which is something that we actually spoke with Jason Bazinet about I think that was catching more analysts off guard they expected that to remain flat they're actually going to continue upping that and that I think is is more noteworthy especially as you think about their ambitions in either live sports unscripted content for all the love is blind fans out there and then additionally what the international scope of that content can look like too yeah that was also similar to what we heard from JP Morgan and Morgan Stanley yeah. out
out in reaction to these earnings here. Just very positive about the fact Morgan Stanley saying that Netflix's business model transition, quote, appears well on track. Healthy double-digit top-line growth here. That looks sustainable, at least in their eyes, beyond this year, heading in to 2025. And then J.P. Morgan also just saying that, hey, these, these results look strong. Upside to subscriber numbers driving that strong start to the year. Full year revenue outlook, yes, Wang, but there is a lot to like within this report, especially when you take a look at some of those investment plans and where exactly Netflix is looking to grow the business beyond 2024 and looking at 2025. The investment plans are fast and furious. It's F1. They brought that up on the call. That is true. Yeah, and the push into sports and exactly what they see that doing uh, for their business here down the road. All right, we'll keep right here on Yahoo Finance. We've got much more of your market action ahead. We'll be right back. We are 45 minutes into today's trading action. We're seeing a bit of a reversal here, not too far from the flat line. When you take a look at the Dow, now up just over 200 points here on the day. You've got the S&P also trading just above the flat line here, but the Nasdaq still in negative territory, off just about a half of a percent. One of the reasons that we're seeing the Nasdaq under a bit of pressure has to do with the losses that we're seeing play out in uh, by Netflix here following their results. But before you get to that, I want to take a look at some of those longer-term trends here. For the Nasdaq composite, you're looking at a loss of just about four 
4% over the last five days. The S&P actually on track for the worst week that we have seen in about six months, on track for its third down week in a row. And you can see it right there on your screen, that steady move to the downside that we've seen since opening in the green on Monday, just initially there. But again, some pressure here across the board. We've got the S&P off just about 2%. When we flip over to the heat map and some of the moves that we're seeing first on the sector basis, at least on an intraday basis, you're looking at energy as the outperformer, followed by financials there. But we can take a look at a five-day chart here. It's a bit of a different picture here. You've got technology actually off just about 5% over the last five trading days, a bit of pressure on some of those larger cap names, followed by real estate and also consumer discretionary. On the flip side, we have seen some strength in utilities and consumer staples, so helping maybe to buffer some of the losses that we're seeing across the board. And real quick, I mentioned that pressure that we're seeing play out in the NASDAQ and why it's so different here for them, what we're seeing play out in some of the other indices, and that is because of the losses with Netflix. You're looking at a drop of just about 8% here today. When you take a look at the year-to-date chart and exactly why we are seeing such a move here to the downside. That has This has really been an outperformer since the start of the year. Shares have been up just about 20% going into this report here. So a bit of a disappointment when it comes to their guidance. Also what they're saying about subscriber numbers. And that's putting pressure on the stock and also weighing down the NASDAQ. Brad. All right. Thanks so much, Shauna. For more on today's market action, let's bring in Maria Vietmanet, who is the State Street Global Markets Head of Equity Research here. Great to see you this morning, and thanks so much for taking some time, Maria. First and foremost, just want to get your reaction to some of the market nervousness that we were just breaking down a, mo a moment ago that's played out over the course of this week. Yes, I, th I, th I think market is very much concerned with uh, kind of this idea that all of a sudden we're getting um, a little, actually, let me take a step back. Market was very, very focused on this kind of soft landing idea, data softening, inflation coming down, we're going to get cuts, but like earnings are fine. So that was kind of the major story. And more and more we're getting the data, uh, getting data being a bit stronger, inflation surprises on our upside, and we are repricing uh, Fed cutting expectations. So that, that's not great for risk assets. When it comes to that, some of that kind of the story. Yeah, Maria, when, when it comes to some of that risk off sentiment that we have seen though play out in the markets this week, is that something that you see continuing into next week? Or will we see maybe earnings that have come in better than expected reassure some of the skeptics out there? Yeah, I think uh, I'm very much looking at like earnings and particularly like next week we have a big tech week, which is hopefully like one part of the market that uh, uh, consensus is very constructive on. That's part of the market that may be less affected by rate hikes as the companies are larger, balance sheets are stronger. So that's potentially something where can kind of put floor under, under the stock. Have we started to hear a, a firm theme emerge over this earnings season from your perspective? I mean, so far, we mostly heard from banks. And uh, the stories there, are actually, uh, I would say, probably less encouraging. So we're hearing, like, banks are, I mean, quite quite a lot of them beat the expectations, but it's very much in kind of trading revenues, uh, in uh, kind of wealth management, asset under management stories are quite strong, as markets are strong. But under the surface, we are hearing about things like uh, loan growth is slowing. We're hearing the cost of deposits, cost of business is rising. So I think for banks, it's kind of okay, but read across the broader economy may be a little bit more challenging. So where are you seeing investment opportunity? What should investors be doing adjustments making to their portfolio in order to better position themselves for what sounds like some uncertainty ahead? Yes, I, I mean, unfortunately, there's probably less to do for investors. So uh, we expect to, uh, to see this kind of the big trend of large caps outperforming small caps. So that's probably our kind of key focus, key differentiating factor between uh, between sectors and factors is that like larger companies and companies with better margins can withstand this kind of downturn a little bit better. And that's what investors have been doing already. So like technology, energy stocks, kind of mega caps, that, that's doing well, that's where big positions are, companies with uh, kind of more uh, lower margins are really struggling, your staples, your, uh, your healthcare stocks, they're, they're under a lot of pressure. And that's likely to continue, in our opinion. Just additionally here on one asset, gold. I mean, can, is there still legs to the gold spike that we've seen? I mean, unfortunately, we're seeing no end of kind of geopolitical tensions, and I suspect that that's that, that, that supporting this trade. So, yeah, sad, sadly, probably probably more, more like there. All right, Mar Maria Vietmane, thanks so much for joining us here at Yahoo Finance. Great to have you. State Street Global Markets Head of Equity Research.
Well, coming up, a look at the consumer. Procter & Gamble reporting its quarterly results out ahead of the bell this morning. We've got analyst reaction for you on the other side. We'll be right back. As rate cut bets shift, so have moves in one sector in particular. Shares of AMD and Intel both down over 15% in the last 30 days. The Philadelphia Semiconductor Index, also known as SOX, dropping over 10% from recent highs. Despite a higher rate environment, our next guest is still bullish on the sector. Matt Bryson, Wedbush Enterprise Hardware Analyst, joins us now. Matt, thanks so much for taking the time here. Walk us through your thesis here, especially given some of the pullback that we've seen recently. Yeah, so I, I think what we've seen um, over the last year or so is that the growth of generative AI is, is fueled um, the chip stocks uh, and the expectation that AI is going to shift uh, kind of everything um, and the way that technology works. Um, and, and I think that at the end of the day that that thesis will prove out. I, I think the question is really timing. Um, but the investments that we've seen that have lifted NVIDIA, that have lifted AMD, that have lifted the chip sector in, sector in general, uh, the large cloud service providers building out data centers, I don't think anything has changed there in the near term. So when, when I speak to uh, OEMs who are making AI servers, when, when I speak to cloud service providers, um, there is still uh, significant investment going on in that space. Um, that investment is slated to continue certainly into 
2025. And I think as long as there is this substantial investment that we will that we will see um, uh, chip chip names report strong numbers and guide for strong growth. Matt, when it comes to the fact that we, we are in this macroeconomic environment right now, likelihood that rates will be higher for longer here, at least when you take a look at the expectations, especially following some of the commentary that we got from Fed officials this week. What does that signal more broadly for the AI trade? Meaning, is, is there reason to be a bit more cautious in this higher for longer rate environment, at least in the near term? It, yeah, so I, I mean, I think certainly from a from a market perspective, um, high interest rates uh, weigh in the market, right? Eventually, they, they weigh on consumer spending. Um, certainly, for a lot of the the chip names, they're they're high multiple stocks. Um, so uh, when you think about where there's there can be more of a reaction or a negative reaction to high interest rates, um, certainly it, it has some impact on those names. But but in terms of uh, again AI changing the fundamental landscape for tech, I, I don't think that high interest rates or low interest rates w- will change that. Um, right. So when you think about Microsoft, Amazon, all of those large uh, data center operators looking at AI potentially changing uh, the the landscape forever and wanting to make a bet on AI to make sure that they don't miss that change. I, I don't think whether interest rates are low or high are going to uh, really affect their investment. I, I think they're going to go ahead and invest because no one wants to be the guy that it missed. Um, the next technology wave. What what is the next perhaps crest uh, of the of the AI wave, if you will? Yeah, so I I, I think that you you have you've had Nvidia announce Blackwell, right? Their their next generation uh, semiconductor uh, product. Um, I I think that for the most part, data center operators are uh, committed to investing. Um, in that next generation of technology, so that in turn allows these these models to get to get larger. Um, what we saw with with ChatGPT in the beginning of the investment in AI, it, w- it was really ChatGPT three point three and a half and ChatGPT four, uh, adding more parameters that made a tremendous difference in terms of what these models were capable of. Um, and, and so I, I think when you look at that next architecture for Nvidia. Um, it, it allows that parameter increase. I, I don't think anyone want to, wants to miss that and miss that that those models potentially being what changes the world. Um, when you get to the end of 2025 um, and you get kind of beyond that transition, uh, certainly if we're not seeing applications show up um, that take advantage of that that increased capability, then at some point I, I think potentially companies have to rethink. You, you know, is there ROI on this investment? Um, should we pause and, and and rethink our strategy a bit because we've committed so much capital um, and doesn't make sense to commit more? But I, I think up until that point, um, these companies have, have have made the decision to commit capital. And I think beyond that point, it, it's a question of do these applications show up? So do we get the next Uber? Do we get the next um, TikTok, if you will, um, that is going to drive consumption um, and in, in turn is going to drive further investment in AI? Matt, I know you like NVIDIA a lot. You have an outperform rating on that name, a $1,000 price target. Outside of NVIDIA, where are you seeing the most opportunity to invest on that thesis that you were just talking about and the excitement surrounding AI? Yeah, so I, another name I really like is is Taiwan Semi. Um, so when, when you think about NVIDIA, I think they've created a great moat in, in terms of uh, protecting themselves uh, from competition. I, I, at the same time, uh, there, there are challenges in the AI space, like, for instance, power consumption. And so is there the potential that uh, another company comes out with an innovative new approach to um, AI that, that uses less power than NVIDIA's chips? Uh, is there the possibility that Amazon or Microsoft, with their own efforts uh, to build uh, AI semiconductors, that they come up with a product that they can use rather than uh, spending so much with NVIDIA? Uh, those are certainly possibilities. Uh, at, at the end of the day, TSM is fabbing for all of those guys. Um, so if Microsoft takes share with their internal products, it's fabbed on TSM. Um, if NVIDIA continues to dominate, it, it's fabbed on TSM. Uh, TSM told you uh, yesterday morning that there is still more AI demand, that they're seeing it double this year uh, or more than double this year, that they still do not have enough production capacity to meet the needs of their customers. 
Um, and, and the only reason they didn't lift guidance is because everything else is, is a little bit slower. But at some point, um, you get a pickup in handsets, you get a pickup in PCs, uh, maybe you get things like AI PCs taking off, and that other business takes off and becomes additive as opposed to uh, netting out the, the AI gains that TSM is seeing. And just lastly, while we have you here, Matt, what is the timeline that you kind of look at many of the advancements in generative AI making their way to some of the consumer devices? Are consumers really feeling like there's this, this huge critical mass moment for generative AI as a result of some of the major investments that we're discussing even right now? No, that, that's a great point. And so that, that comes back to the idea that we're going to see some sort of next generation game changing application get built on these generative AI models. I, I think that's going to happen. But we step back 15 years. Did anyone anticipate that ride sharing was going to be a thing? Um, did, did I anticipate that my teenagers we're going to spend an hour, two hours a day watching TikTok. We're, we're trying to yeah. cut that back, Matt. We're trying to cut that back. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I, I think trying to trying to uh, guess that the next wave of applications is hard. Um, ha having said that, uh, we're, we're certainly seeing uh, places in uh, businesses uh, where it's transformative coding, uh, visual inspection for, for semiconductors. Um, and, and I think at some point you will see uh, those innovations go to the consumer devices. So... Um, I will get uh, uh, benefits in, in terms of my my work productivity. Um, I will see new uh, recreational uh, applications show up on my phone. Um, it, it's just it's hard to project what the future is until the future uh, kind, of, kind of shows up, and we're surprised. All right, Matt Bryson, we have to leave it there. Webbush Enterprise Hardware Analyst. Always great to talk to you. Thanks. Well, we've got breaking news. Fresh Fed is to be coming out just moments ago. Chicago Fed President Austin Goolsby pivoting his outlook for rate cuts. Goolsby now saying it makes sense to wait. Let's get Yahoo Finance's Jennifer Schomberger joining us now with the details on that. Hi, Jen. Hey, Shauna, that's right. Chicago Fed President Austin Goolsby speaking right now in Chicago, saying that he believes progress on inflation has stalled and that the Fed should wait and gain further clarity before moving to cut rates. Uh, in prepared remarks at a conference at the Society for Advancing Business Editing and Writers, Goolsby says, quote, progress on inflation has stalled. You never want to make too much of any one month's data, especially inflation, which is a noisy series. But after three months of this, it can't be dismissed. He went on to say, right now, it makes sense to wait and get more clarity before moving. Shauna, this, of course, a shift from what Goolsby told me in an interview just after the Fed's last policy meeting when he expected three rate cuts at some point this year. He's particularly worried about housing inflation. He says that's been stickier than thought, has been slower to come down. He thought it would have been coming down by this point. And if that doesn't start coming down, he thinks that the path to 2% inflation will be much bumpier than thought. Goolsby, the fourth Fed official just this week to make a hawkish pivot. This, of course, coming on the back of a third straight month of hotter than expected inflation data when it comes to the consumer price index. We will get a reading on the Fed's preferred inflation gauge, the Personal Consumption Expenditures Index, next Friday. Goolsby's comments mark the last from Fed officials before the blackout period, which begins tomorrow before the Fed's policy meeting on April 30th and May 1st, where they are expected to hold rates steady. Again, Shauna, the news here, Austin Goolsby from the Chicago Federal Reserve says progress on inflation has stalled and that he believes the Fed should wait to gain more clarity before moving. All right, Jen, thanks so much for bringing us uh, that. Obviously, we're taking a look at reaction here to the markets. Not much of a reaction here, at least initially. You're looking at the S&P and the NASDAQ, still both in negative territory. The Dow off the highs of the day, still up, though, about 170. All right, Procter & Gamble shares are lower this morning after its quarterly sales fell short of the street's expectations and miss, overshadowing the company's improved outlook. For a deeper dive into P&G's results, we are joined by Filippo Florini, Director of Equity Research at City. Filippo, it's great to see you. So when you take a look at the stock's reaction here, a shares under pressure, a lot of that because of the sales miss. What does that signal just about some of the challenges ahead here for Procter & Gamble? 
Hi, Shona. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So look, the, the quarter was a little bit disappointing on organic sales, which is a key metric in the space. They posted about 3% organic sales growth. The expectations were more 3.5%, 3.6%. So it was a little bit of a miss. They called out some pressure points, particularly in China, which is their second largest market after the US, about 10% of sales. China was down 10% in this quarter. A lot of it is due to market share challenges around their SK2 beauty brand, um, which has been boycotted by Chinese consumer. Uh, there's been this uh, anti-Japanese brand sentiment in China. And also in the US, which is the largest market at about 47% of sales, they call out some destocking in some particular category, particularly personal health care with a soft cold and flu season, uh, which resulted in lower inventory levels. So there were some potential um, one-time impacts in the quarter that should start to get a little bit better in the following quarters. But overall, uh, organic sales results were a bit disappointing in the quarter. Yeah, when we, when we look at where the prices are also increasing here, I mean, grooming, prices went up 10% here in this most recent quarter. When you look across beauty, that went up 4% in this most recent quarter. I mean, it was, it was pretty much down the board here and overall in aggregate by about 3%. How much more can companies like P&G continue to push price higher without consumers pushing back? Yes, Brad, that, that is a very good question and a very good point. Uh, most of these companies, including Procter and most of their CPG peers, have taken significant prices over the last two years to offset the big commodity inflation of really late 2021 and, and 2022. Uh, now, commodities have been more favorable throughout last year and this year, so there's really a lot less room for them to take incremental pricing. A lot of the pricing that you see flowing through their P&L is carryover pricing from the prior year. As we think about going forward, particularly in developed markets, U.S. and Europe, the pricing contribution is going to decelerate quite significantly. And, and really what's left on pricing is more the emerging markets where inflationary levels are, are more elevated. Flippo, what are you say, seeing just on the supply side here in terms of softer demand, going back to what you were just saying there, in certain regions, and also just the ability to get the products to where they need to go? Yeah, supply chain was a big issue last year. I would say they, they fully resolved the big, the big concern around supply chain and the ability really to supply product. Right now, what you're seeing is like some more uh, pressure at uh, the consumer level in some specific markets. Uh, over, overall, though, I would say their two biggest markets overall, U.S. and Europe, uh, they're still doing well from a volume standpoint. The U.S. volume was up 3%, European volume was up 4%. So, you know, the, the consumer level has been, has been pretty good. Their supply chain has been resolved. There's been some pockets of pressure from a, a retailer destocking standpoint and China specifically uh, that we talked about. Felipe, what what does the timeline do you think look like for the rebound then in China? The weakness that we are seeing clearly reflected in the numbers here, also in the commentary that we're getting out following these results. When do you expect to see maybe that uptick? And, and how long will that potentially be a drag on this business as China's economy really struggles to recover? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, China has been a pressure point for over the last two quarters for Procter & Gamble. I think there's probably another two quarters of pressure because uh, a lot of those pressure points really started uh, in their fiscal Q2, uh, which is, again, is two quarters away from them. And, and a lot of it is really tied to this anti-Japanese brand sentiment. The, the China economy has also been soft, to your point, but it's really specific to their SK2 brand. Um, remember, in August of 2023, Japan announced uh, the release of the Fukushima wastewater into the uh, Chinese sea. And that resulted in Chinese consumer boycotting Japanese brand. SK2, it's the biggest uh, of Procter's brands in, in China, and is a Japanese brand. So they're suffering significantly from market share. So there's going to be at least another two quarters until they cycle that negative impact. And then overall, the market in China has been generally softer. They've been able to do better in other categories, for example, diapers, baby diapers. But overall, to your point, the market has also been softer. That part it can probably be a little bit more lingering, but for them, the kind of like the boycotting impact should start to, um, to get better in two quarters. Filippo Florini, Director of Equity Research at City. Thanks so much for joining us here, especially on the heels of earnings. Again, Procter & Gamble stock off a little bit here in early trading action, trading just to the downside. All right, keep right here on Yahoo Finance. we got much more of your market action ahead. Stay tuned.
Bitcoin bouncing back this morning as tensions in the Middle East heat up. Joining us now for the latest on the move higher that we're seeing in the cryptocurrency is Yahoo Finance's Ines Ferre. Ines. Yes, yeah, Shana, and Bitcoin fell overnight to below $60,000 before bouncing back once investors realized the retaliatory attack against Iran was limited. Now, this rally also comes ahead of the upcoming halving for a Bitcoin. Halving is when rewards for Bitcoin miners are cut in half, and it happens every four years. Now, miners also may be selling uh, to shore up some of their balance sheets. Net flows through spot ETFs have been negative this past week. That also has been putting pressure on Bitcoin prices. The cryptocurrency hit an all-time high back in, in March at 73000 just above $73,000 per token. Right now, we're looking at the prices at just above $64,000 uh, per token. And if we just go to the Wi-Fi Interactive, we will be able to see some of the price action with Bitcoin up eight-tenths of a percent. Uh, remember that it Bitcoin tr uh, trades out a 24-7 uh, basis. Year to date, up 45% for Bitcoin. We've also been watching some of the Bitcoin uh, related stocks as well. Just to take a look at where we're at, we're watching a little bit of a, a mixed uh, reaction there. Uh, Marathon Digital up one tenth of a percent. We've also been watching, let me pull up a, a year to riot, also some of the Bitcoin miners here. But let me put up a year to date chart so you can see uh, some of the actual. Coinbase up 25% year-to-date, 90% uh, higher for MicroStrategy, which holds a ton of Bitcoin. So uh, we are still seeing that prices, even though we've seen a lot of volatility over the last couple of weeks with Bitcoin and Bitcoin-related uh, sto um, stocks, we're seeing that year-to-date, they're still up on the cryptocurrency side. All right, Ines, thanks so much for breaking that down for us. And like you were just saying, we're seeing Bitcoin rebounding this morning, hovering just under $65,000. Now we're gaining some of the losses that were suffered earlier in the session, just above $64,000. Now we're gaining some of those losses earlier in the session. That was driven by tension playing out in the Middle East. Now the move higher coming ahead of that highly anticipated Bitcoin halving, which is expected to happen this week and maybe even as soon as tonight. So what's ahead for crypto and miners? Joining us now, we want to bring in Zach Bradford, CleanSpark CEO, Bitcoin mining company here. Zach, it's great to have you. So, so, so talk to us just about first the price action that we've seen in Bitcoin, specifically this week in reaction to some of the tension escalating uh, overseas in, in the Middle East. What does that signal just in terms of that volatility then we're likely to continue to see for Bitcoin? You know, Bitcoin is always a volatile asset and it trades a lot with macro events just as much as it trades amongst inflows and outflows. So, you know, we're, we're seeing this as just a macro reaction. Um, but what we're seeing is the, the bounce back, we believe, shows very strong support. So and this this bounce back is coming, as was previously mentioned last segment, amongst net outflows amongst the ETFs due to grayscale. So we, we really believe that this is Bitcoin showing quite a bit of resilience amongst a risk environment is how we're perceiving it. So we're, we're, we're feeling like good things are ahead for Bitcoin. So. What, do, what do you make of those outflows due to grayscale, Zach? You know, I, I, I view it as... You know, who, who wants to stay in the ETF that has the highest fees? Um, it's it's just capitalism at its finest where the outflows are going, we believe, into um, other avenues, probably to lower fees. But because settlements in ETFs are sometimes T plus one, T plus two, T plus three, mm -hmm. there's always a delay in how the, the capital is moving. Um, and, you know, we, we think a little bit is finding its way into the Bitcoin miners as we are at, you know, some lower points for the year to date. And. Um, hopefully there's some people seeing opportunities there. Zach, let's talk about what specifically this means for your business, what it means for some of the other Bitcoin miners up on the screen, because when this halving takes place, you're essentially getting about half of what it is right now. So talk to us just about the impact that this has on your business in the short term versus the long term and why you're still seeing that long term view as more of an opportunity. Yeah, we're, we're actually pretty excited. Um, an important thing to understand is, you know, this is about the elegance of the, the Bitcoin network itself. And we've all known that this was coming for four years. And so large scale miners like ourselves that have been able to plan for this are actually set to get a bigger piece of the pie. Because although we will go from about 900 Bitcoin, new Bitcoin a day being produced to 450, 
Um, what that means is the efficient miners who have good solid margins will continue to have margins that are very healthy. But miners that were maybe smaller, didn't have scale, or were inefficient when it comes to their energy usage, therefore their costs are higher, they won't be able to keep running their machines. And as a result, there will be less participants taking a piece of the pie, and therefore the large miner, our piece of the pie should get bigger after halving. We, we think to the tune of you know, 10, 15, or even 20%. Okay, and so that, that's looking at your share of production. I mean, even as we think about, though, the having and the costs to mine, now, essentially, aren't your costs to mine doubling in comparison to what the output or the productivity in the amount of Bitcoin that you're producing is? No, you're, you're absolutely right. Our costs will double, which is why it's so important. We prepared to where our margins are well above 50%. So when this happens, you know, our margins may go from 70 to 35 percent. But again, we expect to see that change and adjustment happen where we'll regain at least a piece of that. But in addition to that, we think on a long term basis, Bitcoin was built this way to create additional scarcity. We know exactly how many Bitcoin there's going to be in the future. And as a result, that should create an economic supply shock at some point in, in the cycle. And the cycles continually repeated itself. So we, we think, again, Bitcoin will continue to go up. And so although our margins may decrease from you know today to tomorrow, we think on a long-term view, they regain that space and are even better as Bitcoin goes up into the next bull market, which we believe we're just at the beginning of. Would you be buyers of any operations that might have to sunset as a result of the market share that, that you were talking about you have and, and the production capacity that companies like CleanSpark have? Absolutely. You know, we've been very active in the M&A space for the last several years, and we see this halving event creating a, a buying opportunity because something that's important is their servers may no longer be profitable because they're not energy efficient or they're not run well. But we have done a great job. We've got two sites in the last four years that we were able to take from a less efficient operation to a highly efficient operation by upgrading the servers, by training the personnel better. So we're actually looking for opportunities right now. We have you know, many, many that we're looking at, and we expect that that will continue to increase in the coming months as we see you know, additional slippages or failures of other companies. We see a big opportunity for us to step in, acquire at the cheap, hopefully, and then rebuild it back to a better, stronger business as part of our portfolio. All right, Zach Bradford, CEO of CleanSpark. We appreciate you taking the time and joining us here on Yahoo Finance ahead of the halving. Hey, thank you for having us. Keep it right here on Yahoo Finance. we got much more of your market action ahead. We'll be right back.
China reportedly ordering Apple to remove some of its popular messaging apps from its app store. This is according to the Wall Street Journal. Yahoo Finance's Dan Halley has the details for us. Dan. That's right, Shauna. They're uh, telling Apple to remove apps like WhatsApp, uh, Threads, Telegram, and Signal from the app store. Uh, basically, uh, the journal saying that, uh, you know, Apple denies that this is an issue with uh, China uh, complaining about uh, security or, 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 or things like that, or that people could spread uh, kind of illicit content. Uh, but that's kind of what's going on. You can read between the lines and, and figure that out yourself. Just because China has asked companies to pull apps in the past, um, if not censor things outright. Uh, and Apple basically always says when they are asked to comply with something in China that they are complying with the local laws just like they would comply with the local laws in the U.S. Um, and so that's that's really what we're, we're kind of seeing here. These apps uh, could only be accessed through VPNs. Um, it's not as though they're, you know, absolutely massive apps, billions of users or anything like that. Uh, but they are a, a key gateway for users to the outside world uh, from the Chinese Internet. And so that's kind of the, the uh, concern here. Uh, it's not as though Apple's the only one that would have to pull these apps. They would have to be pulled uh, from uh, any uh, um uh, app store uh, that offers them uh, as a result of this. But we, we've seen in the past where Apple has to acquiesce to uh, the Chinese government's concerns. And Apple does get a, a lot of flack for this, and you know, uh, rightfully so or, or not. Uh, but it's not the only company that does this. You'll recall that uh, Microsoft has to censor portions of its search engine Bing in the country uh, as a result of requests from China. So uh, essentially any company that you see uh, operating uh, some kind of tech aspect um, in, in China that may touch on some subjects that the Chinese government doesn't agree with is going to have to comply with rules like this to some degree. We're seeing Apple shares under a bit of pressure here this morning, off nearly 1% in early trading action. All right, Dan Halley, thanks so much for breaking down the latest on that for us. Let's do a quick check of the market. It's just about 90 minutes into the trading day. You're still looking at a mixed picture. You have, you've got the Dow up around 200. The S&P, the NASDAQ, though, in the red. You've got the NASDAQ under pressure off just about seven tenths of a percent. And then when you take a look at the sector action here, some pressure, especially in the communication services sector. That's among the worst performers as well as technology. The two worst performing sectors in the market here this morning, energy, utilities, and financials. Though still holding on to gains, Brad. Yeah, that's right. We've been tracking XLK over the course of this week. Past five days, down 5.6%. Everyone, coming up, our new show, Wealth, dedicated to all your personal finance needs. We've got you for the next hour covering everything from geopolitical conflict to should you buy those Birkenstocks this weekend? Maybe that's a personal issue. We'll see you on the other side of this break.
Welcome to Wealth. I'm Brad Smith, and this is Yahoo Finance's newest guide to building your financial footprint. Our community of experts will give you the resources, tools, tips, and the tricks that you need to grow your money. On today's show, big talk here after major indices are searching for direction after Iran downplayed the impact of Israel's missile attack in the country. How you should evaluate your portfolio amid geopolitical conflict will discuss as U.S. major averages are mixed. And Netflix shares fallen, as Alicia Keys would say, after announcing it will stop reporting subscriber numbers starting its first quarter 2025. We'll break down what customers need to know from that report. Plus, higher for longer seems to be sticking around. We've been talking about the Fed rate cut debate, but what do higher rates really mean for you? And where do those higher rates have the most impact? We'll explain it all during today's show. But first, Let's take a look at some of the market action. 90 minutes into the trading day, stocks regaining some of those losses, at least for the Dow right now, maintaining that positive territory. S&P 500 and the Nasdaq still in negative territory. Iranian media downplayed the impact of Israel's retaliatory strikes. Yahoo Finance's Madison Mills is on standby at the interactive, the Wi-Fi jumbotron, if you will, to see how things are moving. Well, Brad, it's interesting because we're seeing the S&P 500 slipping below that critical 5,000 level, heading towards its third week of declines here after five days of declines. As you mentioned, just to run through the boards again, we've got the S&P down three-tenths of a percent, the NASDAQ heading towards a decline of nine-tenths of a percent. And that is coming after every single member of the MAG7 is down in the double digits today when it comes to their points on the S&P. Now, this is part of a macro challenge that we're seeing as well. You mentioned Austin Goolsby talking this morning about how there's there's a progress level on inflation that has stalled and a rate hike is not not on the table. That's obviously going to throw some cold water on the market here as we kick off the trading day. We're also seeing that consumers, when it comes to the earnings prints that we have gotten, they are starting to buckle a little bit under inflation. I know you all spoke with PNG earlier this morning talking about consumers not necessarily being able to withstand those higher prices, the $13 Tide Pods that were all being charged on Amazon here. Uh, and then you also have a similar story when it comes to Netflix throwing cold water on the idea of continued growth heading into their second quarter, that leading that name down to declines. I do want to flip the board here to move ahead to another asset class that we are looking at again with Netflix having those struggles on earnings down about um, a little into the 8% range earlier this morning. They were hitting that eight number as well. But I also want to talk about oil because there's some confusion about why the geopolitical tensions that we're seeing are not putting more pressure on WTI this morning. It is below that 85 level that we've been monitoring, uh, but still up eight tenths of a percent. I was looking at some notes this morning talking about why the geopolitical tensions that we saw bumbling over overnight were not putting more pressure on oil. We're seeing it rebounding today. That could be indicative of an inflation story driving up the price of oil. Uh, maybe investors getting in while there is some pressure there or perhaps some questions about whether or not those tensions did hit the level that the street had been anticipating, given that there's some confusion still about what that process looked like overnight here. And just a last look at the green we're seeing across the street screen when it comes to the commodity space, Brad. All right. Thanks so much, Maddie. Teeing up this next conversation and deep dive for us. Back to the biggest story of the day. Tensions in the Middle East rising after Israel carried out a military strike on Iran in response to Iran's drone and missile strike that took place over the last weekend. An Iranian official saying that air defensives intercepted three drones and that there were no reports of a missile attack. Now, these growing tensions in the Middle East can be overwhelming to digest to understand how and why the fallout between Israel and Iran is currently taking place. We've got our very own Rick Newman to break things down for us. Hey, Rick. Hey, Brad. Uh, so this is probably good news, and there's a chance that uh, this demon is going back into the box um, after uh, Israel retaliated with what is a pretty modest um, attack on Iran. So it look it looks as if what's going on here. And by the way, no one is no one no leaders of any of these nations are coming out and saying exactly what's going on. So we have to read between the tea leaves. But um, this was pretty modest, and the fact that Iran can say we shot down these incoming drones. 
um, means that both sides are signaling that this episode seems to be concluded for now. So Iran is not saying we need to uh, strike back against Israel, nor is Israel saying we need to do anything more against Iran. And of course, the reason this matters to investors is because of energy markets and oil supplies. Um, Maddie was just talking about oil uh, prices inching up a little bit. Um, the good news is that, is that they're not spiking to $100 or more, which uh, could easily happen if there was any sign that oil supplies coming out of the Middle East would actually get disrupted. So the oil continues to flow. Uh, there's no sign that that is going to stop, and that is generally good for investors for now. That the, the Israel's war against Hamas and Gaza is still ongoing. Things could change at, at any moment, but this seems to be a little bit of a retreat. Rick, thanks so much for teeing this up for us. We're going to dive a little bit further, especially on those oil prices. Oil prices higher this morning following Israel's retaliatory attack on Iran. Oil prices have jumped over 15 percent so far this year over fears of wider escalation in the Middle East. But amid this geopolitical conflict, how should you be evaluating your portfolio? John McLean, Brandywine Global Portfolio Manager, joins us now. John, thanks so much for taking the time here with us this morning. First and foremost, I mean, this is clearly in the bucket of exogenous threats. Those events that you can't predict will take place. You just have to be able to react to them or have a strategy that already has this baked in into the risk assessment. So how can people exogenous threat proof their portfolio? Well, the, the, there's no surefire way, I think, right. is the answer, certainly. But uh, from, from a macro perspective, we're looking at three things. And you were touching upon it earlier. Oil uh, absolutely is something that uh, you should be looking at. Uh, we've come off a bit uh, during the day and a bit over the past few weeks, but we think there's uh, a lot of reasons for upside potential in the commodity, not just the geopolitical. It's really about supply and demand right now. And supply, look, the U.S. economy is stronger than we all thought. It's plugging along here. You've got countries like India, which is going to be one of the largest uh, you know, incremental consumers uh, doing quite well right now. And then on the demand side, uh, you have issues with potential sanctions around Iran, Venezuela, OPEC uh, holding production cuts. So we look and say, what will, what will we do to express bullish opinion on oil? Well, we like uh, Canada. Uh, we think it's a swing producer. It's picking up some of the production from, from OPEC uh, cuts. Uh, on the large cap side, you'd look at a Canadian natural. On the mid cap side, you look at something like a Meg Energy. And from there, you'd be looking at rates uh, as another thing. And uh, the front end of the U.S. is absolutely a safe haven. It's great carry. Why are you going to worry about risk when you can get 5% from U.S. Treasuries? But the problem is that you really have to be careful in terms about picking where you want to be on the curve. Hmm. Uh, so the front end makes sense to us. The back end, uh, the 10s and 30s can be pretty tricky uh, because of the uptick that we're going to see in Treasury supply and the lack of fiscal discipline that we're seeing. And then finally, we'd be thinking about FX. And uh, right now, it's U.S. exceptionalism. The only place to go for AI is the U.S. The U.S. economy is doing much better than other developed economies. Uh, Asia and Europe potentially much more impacted from a conflict perspective hmm. on geographic proximity. Uh, in terms of trading goods, uh, that leads us to believe that uh, the U.S. exceptionalism piece of the dollar smiles in place. You want to go further into that Europe and Asia portion as well, because for, for some investors, for some who are looking across their portfolio out there, they may be thinking about the globalized element of their portfolio, and, and Europe and Asia will play a pretty significant part of that in some instances, too. So how do you then go about evaluating those regions aptly? Well, you know, you got to think about the construction of what industries are driving. You know, in the U.S., it's certainly a tech perspective. Uh, outside of the U.S., um, you're running different sector exposures here. And also, you have to be thinking about what are the central banks uh, doing? What is the BOJ doing relative to the ECB and the BOE? From our perspective, uh, you know, we think the ECB and the BOE are both going to be in a cutting cycle before the Fed. And so that's going to put pressure on their currencies. The, the BOJ is a bit of a wild card here. Um, so I, I think you have to be paying attention to the signals that they're sending. 
And then just lastly, you're, you're also, and you mentioned this in your notes to us, you're also monitoring the flow of funds that had remained constructive until the week ending April 17th and, and some of the outflows there. Just walk us through that dynamic that you're, you're tracking. Well, that, that, that's about U.S. fixed income yeah. relative to equities. And, and certainly when we're thinking about investor positioning on more of a micro level, uh, we would say fade U.S. equities and buy high yields. Uh, large cap equities are heavily exposed uh, to international marketplaces where the U.S. is much more domestic. And as we said, we like the dollar. Uh, we like the U.S. economy. We think it's a good place to be. Um, we are absolutely paying attention to, again, supply and demand. The technical is very strong in U.S. fixed income right now. We have um, individuals really shifting a lot of their capital away from equity into fixed income. But more importantly, we have your pensions, endowments, and sovereign mm. wealth funds shifting away from equity and into fixed income. Because when you can hit your 7 8 9% hurdle rate in fixed income, and doing it with a safer uh, instrument and less volatility, we see the large institutional allocators continuing to put capital into our marketplace. We had a bit of a hiccup. Mm -hmm. And certainly that makes sense uh, over the past week with the geopolitical tensions, with the tight spread levels that we've seen in the asset class. But we think it's just that, a hiccup. John McLean, Brandywine Global Portfolio Manager. Thanks so much for taking the time this morning, John. Appreciate it. All your markets action straight ahead. You're watching Wealth on Yahoo Finance.
Netflix, the biggest streaming service in the world, reported its first quarter results on Thursday afternoon. Looking at the stock price falling today, it's in retreat by about 8%. Investors, not very happy with the results, but for the casual observers, what is the most important takeaway from these results that's actually sending shares lower? For that, we have Yahoo Finance reporter Alexandra Canal. Hey, Ali. Hey, Brad. Well, one of the reasons why we're seeing the stock move lower is Netflix is no longer going to be reporting subscriber figures beginning in 2025, and that's giving Wall Street a bit of anxiety. We also saw revenue forecasts coming in below estimates here. But I think for the casual observer, an important thing to note is that the password sharing crackdown is working. So unfortunately, I think that's going to signal to other companies that are either in the midst of rolling out their own crackdowns or potentially haven't announced that yet, that this is an initiative that really really works. If you take a look at Netflix subscriber figures, they added more than 9 million in the quarter. And this comes after they added 13 million in Q4. So they're continuing to add those subs. And related to the password sharing crackdown is the ad supported tier. And the ad tier is continuing to do well for Netflix. The company said that ad tier memberships increased 65% quarter over quarter after rising nearly 70% sequentially in Q3 of last year, as well as Q4 four of last year. The ads plan now accounts for over 40% of all Netflix signups in the markets that it's offered in. And on the call, it was very clear that the advertising tier is a big initiative for Netflix moving forward. And that's going to significantly contribute to the company's top line revenue growth. Analysts have said that we're not really going to see the full benefits of the ad supported tier and really the password sharing crackdown as well until 2025. So I think if you're a consumer, just to know that ad supported options, they're going to continue to be on the table for you. And that, unfortunately, you're probably going to want to sign up for those options when you're kicked off of the plan due to the password sharing crackdown. Because, we you know, Disney, Warner Brothers Discovery, they're all rolling out their own crackdowns. I'm sure other companies are going to come out and announce their own crackdowns as well. So if you're a consumer, the ad tier might be a good option for you because it is a cheaper uh, tier relative to what's on the market right now. All so right. so that's really what, what stood out to me from this report. But you know Netflix, always pulling yeah. out Always pulling out all the stops here on their earnings. I mean, and yeah, putting the family members on notice for a lot yes. of the accounts that are actually subsidizing perhaps that experience for streaming mm -hmm. for some other friends and family members. Allie, thanks so much. Thank Let's stay with the conversation, though. Every other day, it seems like there's a new streaming service asking for another 10 to $20 a month from us, the viewers. With this, plus rising inflation, how are consumers dealing with those costs? Joining us now, we've got Cohen Powells, who is the Northeastern University Demore McKim School of Business Associate Dean of Research and Professor of Marketing. Great to have you here with us today. Let's start there. As we've seen some of the pricing power really be showcased by these companies, the streaming companies that are putting service and product into market, what does that mean for the consumers and where have we seen some of that deterioration of propensity to continue to spend into the different tiers of service offerings? Well, great to be here. Thank you. I think, first of all, prices will increase. I think this is pretty obvious to all consumers. Even uh, more from here? Uh, no. Sorry? Even more price increases from this juncture? I would, I would see so, and, and part of what is driving this is the competition, right? So streaming services uh, used to be, for some companies, heavily subsidized. Uh, they were part of their broader offering, for instance. Uh, and so that basically allowed them to spend millions, sometimes billions of dollars to provide content that they hope would spill over to other services. A uh, key example is probably Prime Video and Prime here. Now that those companies are, you know, you know, basically becoming more efficient and, and really questioning how much of that spillover is really happening, uh, you will see that, uh, first of all, for instance, the competition for Netflix uh, is going to be less active, uh, I foresee, going forward, which allows Netflix then again to keep on raising prices. Um, the other thing you notice is the ad-supported tier. So uh, what marketers uh, like myself love about offering the consumer choice is the self-selection. So if you're a consumer who really kind of is upset with the increasing prices more than you are with ads, uh, then you're likely to self-select for an ad-supported uh, tier. 
if you're the kind of consumer who is, uh, you know, relatively price insensitive and you don't want to be bothered with ads and you want all of your shows to be on, on one uh, kind of basic provider, so you don't have to lose the time to figure out which show is where, then you're going to self-select for this uh, ad-free tier, which also means that then Netflix can continue raising prices on that one because their pool of consumers choosing for this non-ad service is going to be more, uh, uh, are going to be more restricted, more selective to don't care about prices that much. Yeah, Cohen, we were just taking a look at the pricing options that are currently in market among and across the streaming service providers right now. I think another huge consideration is the content and what the actual service level that you're getting from these providers is. How do you see that moderating and the quality of content, the amount of titles, and how consumers are expected to engage with that? Well, I, I think every service is really convinced that content is king and that they really have to s continue adding more and more. They're trying to do that uh, smarter than before, I would say. So you're going to see a lot of uh, attempts to uh, to bundle. I also expect consolidation in the industry. There are There is going to be some mergers. Uh, we don't know exactly what's going to happen. Uh, but you're going to see some bundles coming up, right? So in the beginning, streaming services was, oh, hey, we get rid of cable, which was a big bundle of stuff. You only pay for what you want. And that sounds really appealing until you realize, wait a minute, my family is subscribing to three or four services per, uh, per month. It's going to cost a lot. And so these kind of bundles uh, are going to be much more interesting to people who are subscribing uh, you know, to three or four services at a time. Do you, do you think, in addition to bundles, a bundle could even look like a, a shared partnership for things like sports rights? We've already seen that get kicked around by some of the streaming providers. Do you think that'll come to fruition? And if so, how does that create perhaps some type of segmentation for consumer mindsets saying, all right, I can buy into a sports bundle that's going to give me access into some of the specific providers, knowing that that's all I might want to actually stream? I think partnerships are a key way forward. Uh, I mean, when I, when I was at Amazon, I could just see the excitement for kind of getting these uh, these sports uh, deals, uh, which were very expensive, but seen as, hey, this is a way to really become a, a key player in the industry. Uh, now, I think partnerships is a much, much better way forward. I mean, there was a lot of competition bidding for these contracts, which have become very expensive. Uh, and I think specifically, if you... If you target now more on, on which kind of audiences do you really want to attract for your streaming service, um, even if, if sport fans are a big part of that one, and through other data you have shown that these sport fans are just very profitable for you as a company, you still have to be very careful in how much you spend. Um, and, and yes, instead of constantly trying to outcompete each other, partnerships uh, are definitely going to increase in the future. Cohen Powells, who is the Demore McKim School of Business at Northwestern or Northeastern, excuse me, big rivalry there, Northeastern University Associate Dean of Research and Professor of Marketing. Thanks so much for taking the time. Thanks so much. Absolutely. We've got much more on wealth after this short break. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Mortgage rates hitting a four month high this week at over a 7% interest rate. Buying a home may just be too expensive. Well, you could thank the Fed partially for that to break down what the Fed's higher for longer policy means for you. Yahoo Finance reporter Jennifer Schoenberger is here with us. Hey, Jennifer. Hey, Rad. Stronger than expected inflation data is pushing the Federal Reserve to hold interest rates at current levels for longer. A shift expected to keep borrowing costs higher on everything from homes to cars. It's going to continue to be a tough slog paying down debt. It's like pedaling into a, a really stiff headwind. That 20% plus credit card rate, it's going to stay at 20% plus. If you're in the market for a home, it's getting expensive. Mortgage rates are already headed up on expectations the Fed won't cut rates anytime soon. The Fed's policy rate has stood in the range of five and a quarter to five and a half percent since last July. But mortgage rates track the 10-year Treasury yield, which bond traders have bid up to the highest levels this year, 4.6 percent, in anticipation of the Fed holding rates higher for longer. The 30-year fixed-rate mortgage pushed above 7% this week for the first time this year. That's up from 6.88% last week, extending America's home affordability crisis. A year ago, the average 30-year fixed-rate mortgage stood at 6.39%. If inflation stalls any further or even worsens, mortgage rates could head higher. But if inflation continues its slow course down, mortgage rates may be near their highs. The greater likelihood is that the Fed holds interest rates steady and that inflation just proves to be stubborn and coming down. You know, in that case, we don't have to necessarily worry about mortgage rates uh, you know, blowing off and going back above 8% like we had seen last fall. Uh, however, if inflation picks up, and if that is sustained for any length of time, uh, then that becomes a greater likelihood. Uh, you know, those long term rates are really a reflection of where interest rates are expected to be uh, from here to there. The silver lining, higher sustained yields on savings mean higher interest income. So a low risk way to get a good return on your savings or money market funds. Brad. All right, Jennifer, thanks so much for teeing up this next conversation for us, especially with regard to mortgage rates in the housing markets. The Federal Reserve has doused any hope that home buyers had that mortgage rates would soften anytime soon. The average rate on a 30 year fixed loan hit 7.1 percent, according to Freddie Mac. That's the first time the weekly average has exceeded 7 percent this year. That's a significant jump from last week's 6.88 percent mark. For more on the housing market, we're joined by Mike Frantantoni, who is the Mortgage Bankers Association chief economist. Mike, thanks so much for taking some time here on Wealth with us. First and foremost, you actually believe that mortgage rates will gradually decline this year. What's the time frame look like for that? Yeah, well, Brad, thanks for having me. And we did just roll out our new forecast this week. And I think Jennifer covered it well, the inflation news uh, over this past week, the uh, conversations that various Fed officials have had clearly indicating they're going to be slower in cutting rates. And we've moved our forecast from anticipating three cuts this year to anticipating two, the first one probably in September. So Mortgage rates, which are call it, uh, you know, seven and a quarter in the most recent data, we think will be down to about six and a half by the end of the year. It really is going to be reflecting a gradual slowdown in the strength of the economy. And we expect the unemployment rate's going to rise. Not very much. We're no longer calling for a recession. But we do think there's going to be enough of a slowdown that the Fed should be able to feel comfortable cutting rates by uh, September of this year. What if they don't? If we don't see any cuts from the Fed this year, if the Fed perhaps says, you know what, we want to look apolitical, especially in an election year, and they have a history of trying to make sure that that is well intact. So all of that considered, if we did not see any rate cuts, what does that do for the prospect of home buyers seeing lower mortgage rates? Yeah. It's a risk, but I think the other factor that's playing into their consideration really is the global environment. You see the European Central Bank clearly signaling they're going to begin to cut rates. You see currency movements moving strongly against uh, other currencies, the dollar strengthening. That's going to help bring our inflation number down even more quickly than we had thought previously. So I think 
uh, if the Fed really stands out as the only central bank not cutting at some point later this year, that's what is going to push them to move. Totally take your point. They, are, they want to be seen as non-political. We think they are not making monetary policy with an eye towards politics, but to the strength of the economy. But they have a two-sided mandate. They not only have to keep inflation at 2%, they want to keep employment as high as it can get. And I think that employment side of their mandate is going to start looking more troublesome as we get through the course of this year. Existing home sales, of course, roughly about 90% uh, thereabouts of the total sales typically. When we think about the number of homes that are expected to also be built, where will you expect or anticipate that some of those new homes will really start to get or catch a bid compared to some of the existing homes that owners are just sitting on right now waiting for the opportunity to list? Yeah, exactly right. The, the lock-in effect has kept current owners from listing their properties. Most recent data, we only see about 1.1 million existing homes on the market. It's about a three-month supply. More typically, you'd expect to a five to six-month supply. Builders have really sort of stepped into that void. Uh, you see uh, almost half a million new homes on the market. And the way we like to summarize it is where typically you'd expect about 10% of all homes on the market to be new construction. Now about a third of all homes on the market are new construction. So, wow. And you've also seen builders sort of change their, uh, their target a bit and average size of the home coming down, average price of the home coming down. There are so many potential first-time home buyers out there. You know, in this country, there are 50 million people between 30 and 40. Peak first-time home buyer age is uh, mid-30s. So there's strong demographic demand even in the face of these affordability challenges. Lack of supply is really our biggest problem right now. Builders are working to improve that. On the existing side, you're exactly right. Unless uh, rates do drift down, and we think our forecast is in that direction, uh, we're not going to see too much more existing supply hit the market. Yeah, some Redfin data released yesterday revealed that the median U.S. home sale price increased 5% from a year earlier during the four weeks ending April 14th, just shy of June 22's all-time high here. Um, additionally, in some Redfin data this morning, too, luxury homes costing more than ever before, they mentioned here. I wonder, as you're kind of evaluating where there are still buyers that are in the market, especially at that luxury end, you know, how much more they're still willing to pay up, even if it means, you know, costing a little bit more in the near term. Yeah. You know, I think many home buyers, particularly repaint buyers in this country, understand that while they may buy a home at today's rates, they have opportunities uh, over the next couple of years to potentially refinance if rates come down. So mm. uh, the advantage of buying today is you may have uh, fewer competing bids for that home that you've had your eye on for some time. You know, it is spring right now, azaleas are blooming, and with that you start seeing more properties being listed. It's still gonna be a tight inventory market, but for those buyers looking to buy, you know, our expectation is that home prices are gonna be higher a year from now than they are today. So even though rates are higher than anybody would like at this point, there still are opportunities to lock in that home now. Mike, you're just reminding me that I should have brought that, uh, uh, should have purchased that Azalea hat from the Masters when I was there <laughs> in Augusta last week. So thanks for that reminder. Mike Fred and Tony, who's the Mortgage Bankers Association Chief Economist. Mike, appreciate it. Thank you. Certainly. Well, oil prices seesawing today. Right now, we're tracking them after Israel's retaliatory strike on Iran spooked the market overnight. And for much more on that tracking and detail, we've got Yahoo Finance's Ines Ferre here with a closer look at the commodity. Hey, Ines. Hey, Brad. Yeah, and we have seen that overnight, as you just mentioned, that price spike that we saw and then prices coming right back down. So you are looking at WTI just above $82 per barrel and Brent crude at around $80. $87 per barrel, but right again, this price spike that we saw, and this, these are actually the levels that we saw last Friday going into uh, Iran's attack on Israel over the weekend, and then the retaliatory attack last night, that one uh, where we saw these prices elevate, but back down again because of a limited attack. So uh, traders had been anticipating that that attack would be limited, so we had seen prices throughout this week that had eased a bit. 
uh, but then this is a temporary look. What analysts are saying is, is that you are starting to now calibrate the market so that you are really looking at more of a supply demand situation. We are still, though, looking at year to date prices up 14% uh, for Br uh, Brent, WTI up 17%. Uh, this is also because of uh, China's demand. Those numbers have been coming out for GDP in China uh, better than expected. So you are seeing still demand coming out of China that's able to support these prices. Now, whether or not throughout the rest of the year we're going to see these prices. Look, we're seeing some analysts are calling for $90 Brent crude uh, around May, but then you are going to see those prices easing, maybe $85 Brent crude average for the second half of the year. Nevertheless, uh, a rally, but elevated prices for 2024, Brad. And Inez, gasoline prices have been on the rise nationally. The West Coast seeing some of its largest increases over the past month. What about northeastern states? Are they likely to see an outsized spike at the pump? We are seeing an outsized spike at the pump, and that is uh, because of the more expensive gasoline blend that has come into effect in the northeastern states. Think about New York, think about New Jersey, New England. So these states were the last ones to switch over to that summer blend. And so we are seeing a spike in those prices. You are going to be seeing those prices going higher into the weekend. That's a national average that you're looking at right now, $3.68 uh, per gallon, around the same that we saw last year. But on the West Coast, we are also seeing those elevated prices for gasoline. California seeing an over a month period prices spiking around 50 cents per gallon. Now, California historically is a place where your gasoline is higher because of increased taxes and regulations around their gasoline. But nevertheless, you saw that spike because of refineries. Now, the East Coast is seeing these spikes. Analysts, though, are saying that we should be hitting peak Maybe even maybe as soon as this weekend for these gasoline prices. They'll go up again in the summertime, but uh, we should be seeing some cooling off in some areas in the near term. Yeah, AAA saying this is the time of year we may see a bit of a lull in the gasoline demand between the end of spring breaks and ahead of Memorial Day, to your point there, Ines. Thanks so much. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. Everyone, we've got much more on wealth after the break. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
your calendars. We are less than two weeks away from the traditional May 1st college deadline, and students are still waiting on financial aid offers. This comes after a series of setbacks from the free application for federal student aid, known in your hood as FAFSA. The application was originally supposed to roll out a new version of the app, and then some tech glitches when it launched earlier this year after a three-month delay. Then they found another issue this time, issues in processing tax data. So with no solid timeline for when students can receive aid packages, what does that mean for the selection process here for students as well? Kim Cook, National College Attainment Network CEO, here to break it down for us. Hey, Kim, thanks so much for taking the time. I mean, first, what a debacle this has been, uh, an absolute mess. How much more difficult is it making that college decision process for so many families and households? Yeah, we certainly started this year with high hopes for everything that would become of what should have been a simpler FAFSA that expanded eligibility for students. Uh, those things are still true, but as you point out, they have been complicated by technical issues. Uh, we started knowing that we would be opening this form in January, whereas previously it's typically been open in October. So we were looking at a compressed timeline, a later start, but the same finish line. And that's the challenge that you're pointing out today about the May 1 deadline. And so with that deadline in mind, who, who is most impacted right now? Right now, the students who are feeling uh, this the most are the students who rely upon those financial aid offers and financial aid from institutions to be able to afford college, to be able to say yes. Many are asking me, so how are students deciding between colleges when they have admission officers, but no admission offers, but no aid packages rather? Uh, and our concern really is for students from low-income backgrounds, students of color, students who are the first in their family to attend uh, that the question isn't where, but the question could increasingly become, should or can I attend? That would be our greatest fear. One of the fears is that this could lead to a, a lost generation, uh, as, as some have been quipping on the issue here. So how, how do we rectify this? What are some of the solutions that can be put into effect? Uh, so there's still time to inject momentum into this cycle. Right now, the form is functioning well. The form is ready for most students. So right now, if a student has had issues, if a student believes they need to make corrections, now is the time to check in to their portal to find out the status of their form and any actions they need to take. If the student might have seen some of these stories and thought FAFSA is not for me or FAFSA is not working, we'd ask them to please go give it another try uh, and hope for a smoother experience this time. Kim Cook, National College Attainment Network CEO. Kim, thanks so much for breaking this down for us and taking some time. Thank you. Certainly. Everyone switching gears. Finding the perfect sneaker can really take your fit up a notch, but what about sneakers as an investment? Joining me now to tell us about the latest sneaker trends and tips to maximize your sneaker investments, as well as tips to avoid counterfeiters, we've got Scott Cutler, StockX CEO, good friend of the show. Scott, I, I mean, first and foremost, we just got to talk about the spinning shoes behind you. I mean, I imagine <laughs> some type of magnet is at play there. You got to uh, fill us in on, on what exactly is happening in those cheetah sambas behind you. Uh, and, and I'd love to know as well, if someone's looking to become a seller on StockX, what are some of the top tips that they can implore in order to be successful? Well, I chose to highlight just for you one of the top selling products last year, which is a collaboration with Wells Bonner and Adidas in a, in a Samba silhouette. Yes, it's uh, very cool. It's rotating behind me. <laughs> it just highlights some of the trends that we've seen in this marketplace, which is the rise of Adidas non-Yeezy, New Balance, Hoka, On, Uggs, Crocs, that are becoming increasingly popular among the demographic on our platform. But we've also done a lot of work, as we hopefully will highlight here today, all the works that we're doing around anti-counterfeiting and fraud prevention efforts to make sure that this great product gets into the hands of the right consumers. Well, let's talk about that right now. You know, how is StockX squashing some of the counterfeiters. This is always a big concern when you go into any uh, resale platform or any platform where you can purchase something that had already been purchased at retail and now you're trying to validate the, the experience but also the actual products that someone is reselling to. But taking a step back, you have to realize that the U.S. secondhand market alone is projected to be a $70 billion marketplace by 2027. The online portion of that is about half. 
So we have tried to continue to differentiate ourselves relative to other marketplaces by physically inspecting every item that's sold on the platform. And since inception, we have verified 55 million products, and then we've rejected over 600 or, or sorry, 600 million dollars worth of products uh, on the platform. And so it's been a really important thing for us in this report to be able to highlight the work that we're doing using technology to not only prevent bad product from getting to the, to the market, but also preventing bad actors from actually ever even getting onto the platform. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of luxury listings on the platform as well. People want to ensure that it is authentic, that it is real. How do you go about looking at a lot of those luxury listings? What, what are the hot luxury listings that you're seeing on StockX right now? So as we as we look at luxury overall for us, it includes obviously sneakers. It includes apparel and accessories. We've got over two hundred thousand products in our catalog. And important to that process is actually using technology to verify that the product sold on the platform is what it's represented to be. As we look at last year alone, with the use of that technology, we rejected three hundred twenty-five thousand items from reaching consumers. And when we look at the use of that technology, we've incorporated things that are industry standards, such as scanning RFID labels into our verification process to, again, prevent product from getting into the hands of consumers. And again, this product represents the best brands in the world. And so we think there's an opportunity here, given that the secondhand market is so important to consumers, to do a lot more collaboration with brands and marketplaces to raise the standards for uh, the way marketplaces act uh, in the world. Uh, you know, always intrigued. I've, I've been a buyer on StockX on, on more occasion than one here, Scott. And one of the huge things that I think about too is the emails that I get urging me to also be a seller on the platform too. For sellers who want to really be able to maximize their profit, what are some of the ways that they can really tap into this network as well? Well, we have over 700,000 sellers on the platform. These sellers are, uh, you know, are global. They're uh, getting product from around the world where where product is being released. And those products are, you know, those products, uh, you know, essentially that are the most valuable to sellers today are the products typically that are scarce uh, in number. Uh, are typically around collaborations like this one floating behind me, and also you know typically represent something that is highly desired by the consumer. And so sellers on our platform are actively out there finding product, and then we're reaching a demand or consumer demographic that reaches over 200 countries and territories around the world. So it's a truly global game of both demand and supply on the market. Hey, Scott, just lastly, while we have you, you mentioned a, a key word in, a few times in that response, which is the consumer. And it all comes back to the consumer mindset right now, as we've been tracking you know, what the Fed will, what they won't do, and where the data is showing resiliency in the consumer. I, I wonder how you would define the consumer based on interactions that you're seeing on StockX right now. Well, two things. One, consumers have to be inspired by what they see, and those, and those consumers are inspired by innovation, new product, new trends. And so we see that reflected in the market. Consumers are obviously also impacted by the overall things that impact demand. So inflation, war, uh, insecurity about jobs certainly is reflected in what the consumers are saying today. But I think since our platform represent that, represents that next generation of consumers under the age of 35, what we also see is the consumerism is changing and that consumers are really focused on the right thing at the right time. And what I'm inspired by is what you know, those consumers are seeing out there in the market and then be able to get access to that product on marketplaces like StockX to fuel their passions. What type of year do you think this will be for, for StockX, Scott? Uh, for us, you know, this year in light of all of those things, you know, I'd say we're working with brands, we're working with partners to be able to provide a great experience. And I think key to that experience for us is having great technology to ensure the integrity of the platform. And it's also providing a great experience that accessing the right products from the right brands uh, in an authentic way. And that's our role to be able to build trust and confidence in the marketplace, but also to be able to serve consumers around the world. All right, I'll be right back, Scott. I got to go buy some magnets so I can display all my shoes like that at home as well. Scott Cutler, great to see you as always, StockX CEO.
Thanks. Absolutely. Guys, coming up, Caitlin Clark, one of the most famous athletes on the planet. So how is it that her rookie salary is only $76,000 this upcoming season? We'll explain why when we return. Well, it's no mystery. Caitlin Clark is an absolute game changer. Earlier this week, the basketball phenom was drafted number one overall by the Indiana Fever in the WNBA draft. But after her rookie salary went viral online this week, the discussion of proper compensation for female athletes, that is back in the forefront. In fact, a few weeks ago when I sat down with basketball trainer and entrepreneur Chris Brickley, this exact topic came up. Let's see what he had to say. What do you think the next kind of tipping point is, as you discuss with players, team owners, people? Yeah, it's almost like they need to get that. They need to figure out a way to figure out the money standpoint. It's mm -hmm. tough for, you have to think most WNBA players, they play the WNBA season, and then they have to go overseas because it's like they don't, they don't make enough money just to just play in the WNBA. Now, for more on this, here with me is my Morning Brief co-host. Uh, we had to call in the big guns, Shauna I'm Smith. Honored. A Yahoo Finance's favorite D1 athlete here. <laughs> Shauna, I mean, this has been absolutely viral over the course of this week. Just eye-popping here at the end of the day. It has been. I mean, this is just remarkable in all of the wrong ways, right? Just it, it, the, the pay gap and, and what is playing out right now between the WNBA and the NBA and the spotlight now on Caitlin Clark and exactly what she is making is really putting the spotlight back on gender inequality and what is really being uh, shown here in the pay. So we have it up on your screen right now, but if you could go back to actually what she is making. It was up on your screen first, but her overall salary, to put it in perspective, 338000 That's over... 
four years. I think when a lot of people, when they initially looked at the number, they assumed that was going to be the first year of what she was making, which is still a fraction of what NBA players make. But that is over four years. So her first year, she's just going to be making right over 76000 That improves to seventy eight to eighty five, And then eventually that fourth year where she's still making less than $100,000 a year. Now let's go to the comp of comparing her. She was the number one draft pick for the WNBA and comparing it to the number one overall NBA draft pick last year. Victor Webanyama, he is making just over $12 million in his first year. He signed a four-year contract securing $55 million. So that's $12 million he's getting paid out in his first year compared to just $76,000 for Caitlin Clark. Now, I'm not arguing that this should be the same because WNBA's uh, annual revenue, clearly just a fraction of the NBA, but the start, the wideness of that pay gap is what yeah. really has people upset. It is important to point out that Caitlin is going to be making more than just 76,000 when you talk about the endorsements, exactly who she is partnering with. There's been a number of teams that she has, or a number of brands that she has teamed up with here. Nike, Gatorade, Bose, State Farm, Buick, just to name a few. But this has really gotten not only social media's attention, but the president's attention as well, Brad. And he tweeted out earlier this week that right now we are seeing that even if you're the best, women are not paid their fair share and that it is time that women are paid what they deserve. And, and this, a star like Caitlin Clark, she sold out stadiums, right? The finals in the final four right now, it was, they had viewership numbers that were better than the NBA finals, that were better than the World Series, that she is getting paid a fraction of what the male counterparts are. And also putting this in perspective real quick, the, do, the highest paid WNBA player right now is Jackie Young of the Vegas Aces. She makes just around $252,000 a year. That's less than the lowest paid NBA player who actually went undrafted and he's making 289,000. So really puts it in comparison. And I think the argument here, WNBA players are not saying that they should be making exactly what the NBA players are making, but they should be making more and they should be making a livable wage and not be forced to be playing overseas. Here's how we change this as well. Go out, buy the jerseys, yeah. get tickets to the games here. By the shoes, you've seen more NBA players wearing the staple shoes of Sabrina Ionescu mm -hmm. this year as well. And I think that's doing something to actually change the dialogue and the pathway as well. Shauna, yeah. thanks so much for breaking Thank this you. down. That's it for now. I'm Brad Smith. Thanks for watching Wealth. We've got much more here on Yahoo Finance later today and on Wealth next week.